get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Roger Sharp, and many more and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Roger Sharp, who's one of the most idolized people in pinball history. He's the Babe Ruth of pinball when he called his shot in 1976 to help legalize pinball. Roger was considered one of the top players in the world and now his sons are among the top in the world also he has worked in game licensing and marketing for over 35 years roger thanks for joining me it is my pleasure thank you you. so i know we're having some bandwidth issues and i want to give a special thanks to steve rosen for helping make this happen and he is also one of the best three-point shooters i've played basketball with (laughs) and so I'm really excited to get into this, and since we're having bandwidth issues, I just wanted the video to show up in the beginning, and now we're going to go to the the landline so we make sure all your big lessons uh, come through. All right. did, did you want to stay with this for a while until it craps out, or it's up to you? Sure. We could stay with this. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about first is, you know, I watched a lot of videos for you, and then the Vice video you told me about. Um, about some history of pinball, you and your sons. What was so emotional for you about that documentary? I think you know, talking about the choice of language that uh, one of my sons tends to use while he's playing pinball, which is always a nice reflection on his upbringing. Um, I, I think, in all seriousness, it was the fact that you know the life that we live. At least this is my view: the life that we live as as parents. You'd like to think that the children that you raise have some uh, degree of, of uh, respect and admiration for, for who you are and what you're about and yeah. hopefully the life lessons that you teach them. Yeah. And I think that that was why. I, I think it was just it was just an emotional time of, you know, my feeling that, and again, my, my life, specifically pinball and, and so on, uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, I haven't embarrassed them too much. Um I think you've seen some of the videos in the way that I tend to play. It's a little bit more theatrical, a little bit more physical than a lot of other people. Not saying that it's the right or the wrong way. There's reasons behind why that is. The why way is that? It is. Why is it? Because um, I did notice it, that you have like a staggered stance. And oh yeah, yeah. no, I mean, yeah. a lot of it is uh, predicated on the fact that I have two ruptured discs in my back. Oh wow. So, you know, when you're playing pinball, I mean, if you're playing competitively or, or whatever else, the ability to kind of, you know, stand um, takes a toll on my back. So I wind up just doing things to kind of alleviate mm. any of the stress or pressure that I have. You know, yeah. Steve Rosen, uh, aforementioned, uh, we've had a chance to play golf from time to time. And uh, I know that some people, when they see me tee off, if they raise my leg, they know that I've gotten a good shot because, again, it's just kind of releasing some of the uh the stress and and whatever uh, pressure that i'm putting on but yeah. again going back to the original question um i think it's really just uh wanting them to have an appreciation for mm-hmm. for who i am yeah. out in the real world so yeah so it was emotional yeah and there were some other things that were kind of going on during the course of that weekend as well so it, I, I think that it just all caught up with me um, yeah so yeah, his he was wearing a shirt that said "My Dad Saved Pinball." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends of theirs have uh, done some uh, fun stuff in the past. So when did they start beating you? Um, well, I mean, let's 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 put that in proper perspective. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> they they do tend to win more often than not. There not always. Okay. There are occasions where uh, I, I blindfolded them. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> You know, I would think probably over the last 10 to 15 years or so, mm-hmm. maybe longer, uh, when they got seriously into playing competitive pinball, um, they were not really allowed to play pinball growing up. I mean, we have pinball machines. They weren't. Uh, why not? Some of the games, yes. Some of the games, no. Um, 
I didn't want them getting caught up in the games. I mean, I, I had a very, very specific way of wanting to, to parent. And yeah. it didn't include, you know, playing pinball. I've gotten asked over the years just because of the skill level uh, by some people, uh, majority of them being women, just saying, so um, when they came home from school, did they have a set time to do homework and then practice pinball? It's like, no, God, no. I mean, I, it was part of their lives, obviously, yeah. but it wasn't something where it was like, go and play. If anything, I think that the beauty of it was that they kind of took it for granted. So when their friends came over, they loved who, it. who yeah. you know, my sons were ready to play on any of the game systems we might have had, right. they were automatically going to the pinball machines. Mm. Um, so, again, um, I think that probably within... Uh, you know, the past 15, 20 years where they have really kind of achieved uh, a higher level of, of game playing and game analysis. I've, I've always looked at competitive pinball as being uh, uh, comparable to chess, where you're looking at the, the beginning of the game, mid-game, and it's really the end game. It's a question of, you know, how do you control that board, if you will, yeah. with whatever pieces you've sacrificed and wherever that, that power may be in terms of how you move forward to, to hopefully achieve a checkmate against your opponent. The same thing, really, if you wind up analyzing pinball. And each game is different, and each game plays differently, but there are certain objectives, and it's a question of really determining what's your best way to go. And my son tends to joke that, uh, you know, oh, yeah, our dad will make a, a ramp shot over and over again just because he likes it, not because it's worth points. <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's that kind of stylized difference. In approach, so who tends to win the most out of the three of you? You and the two sons. Oh, uh, either Josh or Zach, most definitely. Me, no, uh, hardly ever. Um, I think if we're playing older style games, where some of the nuances and subtleties of, of how you play a game and how you trap a ball and control, because you're more experienced um, at those. I am, and and I think that you know it's it's interesting. I, I tend to also use golf analogies because. Uh, the old-time golfers from Sneed and Hogan and whatever else played with real woods. They didn't play with the new technology. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, a long drive was 200 yards. Now it's like, you know, 200 yards, that's, I don't know, that's a, that's a seven iron. That's an eight iron. <laughs> um, that and technology I think that, has changed. Well, I'm sure of the course layouts and what they've done, forgetting about traps, water, trees, and whatever else, we're just talking about the sheer length. You wind up hearing, well, this golfer is going to have some trouble because he's not a long hitter. So he's going to have to be accurate. It's going to take him three shots for the par five, where some of the other guys, it may be two shots. So you wind up starting from that deficit, and I think it becomes you know, problematic as to you know, what level of success that you can have. And for my sons, they've played on older games and newer games, but again, the style and methodology of gameplay without getting into the intricacies of it, because I think it's probably for people who don't play pinball incredibly boring, um, I, I think that what they've been able to attain and achieve is really, really remarkable. And then between the two of them, it's just a question of who's on that particular time. The, the majority of tournaments that take place, there's over 2,000, and that number is growing worldwide. Every year? Of the number of events, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, it's, it's astounding. If you go to the IFPA website, yeah. IFPA Pinball, uh, you'll get a sense of things as to what we've been able to achieve and accomplish. But within that context... Most of those competitions are marathons. I mean, you're starting on a Friday and you're playing, you know, really? all day Friday into the wee hours of the morning. And yeah, how many hours early? How many hours will one player play for? Like, a, let's say they get to the finals. How long? How many hours of pinball will they have played? Probably about fifty or sixty hours in a two and a half day stretch. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's literally almost your every waking hour. So you're starting at maybe eight o'clock in the morning and playing until two in the morning. And then you're getting up to play at 8 o'clock in the morning until maybe midnight or, or 1. And then you're getting up again at 8 o'clock in the morning and playing through. I know that for both of my boys, yeah. if there are events that are taking place where they have flights, I know that they have uh, on occasion missed those even the same. So how do you train for that? I mean, you're standing up for three days straight. And, and I think I watched one of the documentaries – one of your sons, I don't remember which one, says he sweats profusely through the whole the whole time. How do you train? Do they train for this or are you just playing? I, I play, but I think really it's a question of analyzing what are the games that are going to be played. 
<clears throat> do they tell you ahead of time or do you sometimes yes sometimes you do know all right here's a lineup of games other times you're going in totally cold yeah and it's a question of what the structure of the the tournament is if you can find some time to sit back if you can find some time to maybe grab a bite to eat and i tend yeah. not to eat while i'm playing in tournaments uh, i drink a lot of tea if i can or or whatever else you know the training purposes you were you're talking about and you just drink a lot of tea and try and get as much rest, but nothing. You're not doing like sets of push-ups or anything. To oh train God, for... no! <laughs> um, you know, I think that some guys are disciplined. Yeah, uh, and absolutely, uh, guarantee that they probably have some types of routines that you go through. Yeah, but otherwise, you know, in all honesty, you're just sucking it up. I mean, you're just kind of going for broke. And as I said, a lot of it is just the, the pacing of all right. What's the format? I need to qualify. Uh, if I qualify in the top four or the top eight, I get one buy or two buys. If I qualify further down, that means i got to start early in the morning uh, and, and just kind of go for broke. Is it a single elimination? Is it a double elimination? Um, yeah. So a lot of those types of, of uh, requirements, if you will, uh, for each individual tournament really kind of sets you up for, you know, how am I going to approach it? Yeah. And I think that, you know, the boys may tell me something or tell you something different. They yeah. may say that, oh, no, we uh, do X, Y, and Z, but as far yeah. as I know. How uh, many tournaments do you go to per year? Not that many. Yeah. Um, I, interesting, I never really believed in playing uh, competitive pinball. Okay. Um, I, I, and it's just my quirkiness in regard to the, the relationship that I've cultivated between myself and, and pinball in general. But if it's somewhere local, because I don't have to travel. Like your basement? Uh, then, then I'll do it. I mean, there's a pinball league that I've been part of since it started. Uh, God, I want to say maybe we started it about 15, 16 years ago. Um, there are some events. There's one that's happening now for those who are in the Chicagoland area. Please let me promote it at level 257, uh, which is at Woodfield. Uh, it's a month-long tournament. You can qualify hmm. during the course of the entire month, and the finals are on the first Tuesday of every month. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are places now, a lot of the barcades that are in the city, Logan Hardware, Emporium, Headquarters, and uh, there are events that they are staging on a you know regular basis, and people always ask, so are you going to come downtown? And it's like, no way in hell. <laughs> I mean, I'm out in the north of suburbs. Right. And the idea of, of traveling down into the city is not appealing to me unless it's work-related. Yeah. So um, there are some events that take place, you know, outside of the city limits, if you will. Uh, I know that my son's is a birthday surprise present. I, I thought of it as being a punishment. Uh, signed me on to play in a major event in Pittsburgh last year in the summer. Yeah. So went to How'd that. it go? Uh, I think I surprised myself and everybody else by actually qualifying in the A division after a brutal series of rounds. Uh, again, we were talking about you know the amount of time spent and yeah, you know, started on a Friday and it was like, God, you know, I'm playing the entire day and it, it, it's it's painful. I mean, it's painful to to the point that you had kind of expressed to be on your legs the entire time. Right. Who's the so most feared player? Right chairs now. anywhere? Yeah. Am I sitting on the floor? Let me hydrate. I mean, is there any Lipton tea? Is there some type of something? Juice? Because I, I don't want to drink soda because it only makes you thirstier. Right. Um, and, and playing through to, you know, to the conclusion of, of getting, as I said, into uh, the, uh, the final, you know, round, if you will, in the A division. Not yeah. the final finals, which my son Zachary actually won. Uh, wow. which was glorious to actually be there in person. Many of the tournaments are actually available where they stream them. Oh. So them online. So I've, I've spent hours literally on the computer kind of watching. watching. The I've seen camera. that. And the video, you can see the video cameras above the... Above pin. the machine. Yeah, above the machine. Yeah. Yep. So I've, I've seen the boys play that way, but to actually be there and the, the Pittsburgh tournament, the Pinburg tournament, was one of the majors. Mm. There are about four majors, uh, a la golf, again. Right. Uh, and uh, Zachary had never won a major. So it was huge, and it was just, it was just again, great to yeah. be there 
to witness it uh, in person and to see him in the spotlight. What do people win for winning the tournaments? Uh, that particular one, I think it was uh, $15,000 wow. for first place. Nice. No, there, uh, right now, uh, I think the uh, through prizes, cash, and whatever else, uh, the various tournaments that I mentioned before, about the 2,000-plus events taking place worldwide, I think we're in excess of about a million and a half dollars. Mm. Uh, wow. And a lot of them are smaller, don't get me wrong. You know, Some of them are just hundreds of dollars. Some of them, again, go up to multiples. Uh, some yeah. of them, it's, it's a brand new machine, which can be worth $10,000 and into itself. Right. So, oh, yeah, uh, right. So, and some of it is just, you know, the trophies and uh, just the bragging rights of knowing that, uh, you know, this is a person that's, you know, kind of a, You're the, the best. Uh, an ultimate. Yeah. I mean, I want to get into some of your, your you have so many great marketing lessons, some amazing stories in the industry. Uh, we'll talk about the Babe Ruth when you called your shot and um, licensing. But I have to ask some specific pinball questions because I'm interested in um, those first. Um, the pinball game you think that you dominated most oh wow um in what era like if you were any like right now if you were to say we're going to do this tournament everyone in the world and you get to pick which pinball game everyone gets to play i'd like to think it'd be one of the ones that i designed which one yeah which one uh, i know if there's a tournament coming up hopefully nobody will listen to this who are actually playing it uh, this coming uh Saturday, it's for the uh, Illinois State Championship. Um, uh, and it's actually taking place at my son Josh's house. But uh, okay. Sharpshooter is there and Cyclops are there, and those are going to be two of the games that I'm going to be picking. Uh, I feel comfortable on them. I know the rule set. Yeah. It's just a question of whether or not it's going to be my day. Yeah. But if, it, if you go back in time, uh, you know, the, the game that I mastered, the first one I ever mastered was, was a game called uh, Hurdy Gurdy. Uh, Gottlieb single player. Um, the game that I played in court was a game called Bank Shot that I felt really comfortable with. You know, there are certain eras. Everybody always says, "Oh, this is going to be Rogers Night for League because there's a lot of old school games." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in terms of, you're like you created this one. <laughs> no, I really. How, how many did you end up designing in in having your hand in the creating wise, like the Sharpshooter and Cyclops? How many were there? Oh, as as. Um, as a, a principal designer, we're looking at, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, I think six. Six, okay. Uh, influencing other games. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to think that, you know, I've had a hand. I started it's hard to at, count those, yeah. at Williams Valley Midway back in 1988, and we stayed in pinball until 1999. So yeah. any and all of the games that were brand licensed themes, yeah. you know, Adam's Family, Terminator, and so on, yes, I had a hand yeah. in it. Uh, some of them, you know, maybe I made a suggestion or two or had an observation for the design team. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I guess the, the influence has been there for, for quite some time. Yeah. So, Roger, talk about the design. So, I mean, you had your hand as a primary designer in six of them. Yes. Um, you know, talk about the thought process that goes into, because I, I heard you do one interview, very methodical in why you do certain things in the design and everything. I don't know which one would be best to talk about individually, if it's Cyclops or Sharpshooter, but can you talk about your thought process of how you actually would think about doing the design? Sure. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be specific to those necessarily. I think okay. you wind up looking at, and, and again, forgetting about you know a, a specific theme. Yeah. I think you look at a balance. You know, there, There's an area, a play field, uh, that area is going to be populated with particular components, whether yeah. it's stand-up targets, drop targets, spinners, ramps, lanes, um, flippers, jet bumpers. You know, the list kind of goes on and on. Yeah. And it's a question of, you know, what kind of balance do you want to bring to a game? The games that I designed, admittedly, were from a different era. Um, you know, the original Sharpshooter was in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, the follow-up was 1984 when we did Sharpshooter 2. Mm -hmm. Cyclops is 1985. So technologies have changed, but if, if I go back to those games specifically with Sharpshooter, for people who are somewhat familiar with it, or they can check on the Internet Pinball Database, yeah. um, 
for that game, I was influenced and inspired by a Gottlieb pinball called uh, Free Fall or Sky Jump, depending on whether or not it was a replay version or an anti ball version. And they have a uh, slanted row of drop targets mm -hmm. that I found very, very compelling. Really enjoyed it. Why? Okay. Why? Okay. Why was it compelling? Challenging. Well, because they were in proximity. Okay. It was something where you know, finish off the drop target bank, and in the case of the game I was playing, you could get added balls uh, to to the gameplay. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a question of ranking up specials or free games, and it was just that challenge of being precise and methodical to finish off the bank of targets. Mm -hmm. I just really enjoyed that. Now. There was another game, a Williams game, called Satin Doll, which featured two jet bumpers at the bottom of a play field. And I kind of liked that, although the positioning and the power of them really didn't materially change the gameplay. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I could combine those two elements? And the purpose for wanting to combine the jet bumpers, and if you look at the layout of Sharpshooter, I thought, wouldn't it be incredible if, with these two lower jets on the right side, if a person could complete the bank of targets without ever flipping, just by the rebounding action off mm -hmm. the jet bumpers? Mm -hmm. So that was the opening premise. And the rest of the game kind of followed suit in terms of adding a spinner to get back to the top of the play field, up to the lanes a kick-out hole, and a loop around with rollovers. Again, everything was done in a fashion to have it be balanced and choreographed in a certain way. What I will share is that initially, and, and it's something I think that the successful pinball designers are able to achieve, initially, and again, I don't want to get so heavy into rules and whatever else that everybody is kind of like yawning, but bear with me for a couple of minutes. Yeah, go ahead. In describing this. Initially, what I wanted you to do was to finish off the bank of targets and then be forced to aim and shoot into the kickout hole in order to get your multiplier. Mm-hmm. I realized that for me, that was kind of easy to do, but for the average player, that was going to be really, really difficult. Mm-hmm. I wanted to simplify it. I didn't want them to be frustrated. Look, the best games are games, whether it's pinball machines, video games, right. or anything else. That's why I want to hear your lessons for this, because I think uh, it applies across the board. Whatever. Well, it, and it does, because yeah. the, the best games are games that are easy to understand and difficult to master. Yeah. Pure and simple. I mean, either you know it intuitively when you walk up and you see whatever the game is that's before you. Mm-hmm. It's a video game. Maybe there's an attract mode, and it's like, oh, okay, this is a slide and shooter. This is, you know, a left to right type of game. Whatever again, the, the the game pattern is. For a pinball machine, you're looking at really the the overall layout and determining. All right, it looks like I have a fan, and a fan is you know it's five basic shots. There's an outside loop. There's an interior spinner. Again, you kind of go through uh, the various parts of that play field and try to uh, disassemble it in a way, if you will, of understanding, all right, where are the shots geometrically that make the most sense? So going back to Sharpshooter, I made the modification that if you complete the bank of targets, you'll automatically get the bonus multiplier of 2x up to 5x. Mm -hmm. If you go into the kickout hole, whether you completed a bank or not, guess what? I'm going to give you a multiplier there as well. So, mm -hmm. again, it was a question of wanting it to be uh, much more approachable for the average player. For the skilled player, look, you still got to finish off the bank of seven targets, um, which is, you know, not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, and there are still other elements within the gameplay. Cyclops, I went a little bit further in terms of having not only drop targets, but stand-up targets behind it, those drop target banks, two of them. And again, uh, a deeper rule set because six years had passed, and admittedly the technology had embraced uh, deeper rule sets. So, uh, and in between, I wound up doing a game called Barracora, where I had resettable drop targets where you had to get them out in order uh, to spell out the name of the game. Mm -hmm. 
So, again, I think that for most designers, you want to appeal to, you know, the the somewhat um, ordinary player, the casual player. Mm -hmm. And you want to have enough rules and enough objectives and enough depth so that the more skilled player, forgetting about whether it's in competition mode or not, the more skilled player has a challenge mm -hmm. where it's not a question of just playing with your, you know, with your eyes closed. You know, over the years, people have asked me from time to time, so, Roger, what game should I get? Do they mean in general? I want to buy a game, game for my home. Pinball? Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. my answer is twofold. One, have you played pinball? Do you have familiarity with it? Oh, yeah, and I really like Game X. Mm -hmm. That's the game I want to get because I can beat that game all the time. Really? So if it's going to be at home, it's going to be on free play. Right. You can beat it all the time. How long do you think that it's going to be still a, a fascination for you? Right. Still an allure. Or do you want to go with a game that it's going to challenge you? Right. And my, my, my personal example of that is the fact that, you know, the first game that I ever got was a game that I couldn't really beat all the time when I was in college, mm -hmm. when I really started playing. Which I was which? The game that uh, I've mentioned before, Hurdy Gurdy Central okay. Park. Uh, that was the one that, yeah, I could beat. And I had the opportunity to get that or a game called uh, Cowpoke Buckaroo. And I wound up buying the uh, the Buckaroo. Mm -hmm. I wish that it had been the Cowpoke, which is the Attaball version, because the gameplay is significantly different, but that was my first, my first machine. So I wind up telling people, if there are no specific machines that you like, per se, mm -hmm. or have familiarity with. Yeah. And make a determination for your own personal purchase. Does it have to have multiple flippers? Do you want there to be multiball? Do you want there to be ramps? Look at the elements that you want in a game and then try to find games that resemble those elements that you like. Yeah. Because ideally that investment will last and endure much longer than the ones that will just kind of be ones that are just a novelty that you have and suddenly it's a nice place to pile up laundry so i remember when you were talking in holland that you said the the games have increased in value yes yeah significantly because every game is a limited edition oh. and interestingly the physicality of pinball adds more value you can get pac-man just as an example, mm -hmm. to play on any type of device that you might have. You don't need the full-size cabinet. The gameplay may be a little bit different if you're playing it on your iPhone. Right. Maybe a little bit different if you're playing it on your computer and you're playing it off of your keyboard rather than with a joystick. Yeah. You're still playing Pac-Man. Right. Well, you know, if, if you're going to play Adam's Family and, and uh, there are, you know, ways that you can play it, you know, on, you know, your computer or what have you, Farsight has done a remarkable job in bringing any number of... The pinball of, version, you mean? Of right, of, games yeah. to the world of virtual pinball. Yeah. And I think that that's great. But it's not the physicality, and I'm right. actually sitting here next to an Adams family. My uh, wife, I, I believe their parents, that's what they have in their basement, the pinball, the Adams family pinball, because of the okay. DeMars. Yes, yeah. yes. Larry DeMar and... Uh, Pat Lawler and the rest of the design team, John Yowsey on artwork, Chris Graner, uh, yeah, did uh, just a remarkable job. The most successful pinball machine in the modern era. Really? Uh, is that right? Yeah, it is. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, so, again, I mean, there's a situation of why the games have appreciated in value, in many cases, to buy an older game, 10 years old, 20, 30 years old, depending on the condition, it may cost you double or even triple or more what it would have been as a brand new game in the box. What does that's one cost now true. if someone wanted to get a new one? What's the depending on the condition of the game? Yeah. Uh, God, uh, like I what's guess the, the classic remake? example that many people point to is a game called Medieval Madness. There's a remake that is available now, but if you wanted an original Medieval Madness, it might have been about 
4500 or $5,000 mm-hmm. uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, now you can get one of those used games for around 15000 Wow. Yeah. That's so it's crazy. I mean, it's like coin collecting, stamp collecting. Yeah. There's absolutely... An Who is the largest collection in the world, do you know? No, I mean, there's any number of people that literally have hundreds upon hundreds of games. There's a number of different museums that are open. There's yeah. one in San Francisco. Uh, there's one I visited in Rotterdam. Uh, there's a place in France. And there was a setup in Washington for a while. Uh, the Pinball Hall of Fame in Las Vegas. I know I'm leaving things out. And yeah apologizing in advance for ones that I've inadvertently omitted, but uh, you can find individuals that have personal collections that are mm-hmm. literally in uh, the hundreds of games yeah. with all of them functioning. It's not just a question of yeah. warehousing them. They work. It's, uh, yeah. Part of uh, you know, their hobby. <laughs> How many do you have? I have 25. 25. Plus, uh, four antiques, including the first one ever patented. From 1871. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, How'd you get that? There's a story behind it. There was a fellow by the name of Ken Rubin, who was married to Fran Rubin. Met him when I was doing research for my pinball book. Um, he was in, uh, they lived in Park Slope, and I was living in uh, Manhattan. And uh, heard about Ken, and went out to visit him, and he had this incredible collection. In fact, he, uh, he and his wife did a book I want to say it was called Antique Amusements, mm-hmm. a nice picture book, um, paperback, um, kind of chronicling and highlighting uh, many of the games from the turn of the century on through, so old vending machines and, and other novelties from, from that era. Mm. And uh, one of his prized possessions, um, among others, uh, was Improvements in Bagatelle from Montague Redgrave. And... In the middle of the night, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school after all these years. Um, I was living at 21st and 7th in New York, and there is a knock on my front door in the middle of the night, which is somewhat shocking, <laughs> in my studio apartment. And I went to the door, and it was Ken. And I opened up the door, and he said, Here. And it was like, Huh? Fran and I are getting a divorce, and I don't know what's going to happen with all of you know our collection. But I know if anybody would treasure and value mm. and keep safe this particular machine, it would be you. So here, it was a pinball yeah. machine. Uh, yes, if, if, if like I don't a, know if you had a chance to look at my pinball book, but if you go back through, because the internet is now a wonderful way to to find almost anything. If you look up either Montague Redgrave or Improvements in Bagatelle, you will find this this wood board. Uh, with pins and little scoring cups. Uh huh, uh huh. Uh, and that was the first game ever patented in 1871 by oh. Monty Redgrave out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Wow. Because I was thinking was studio apartment in New York. I don't know if you have room for a pinball machine. Oh, uh, actually, uh, at one point in time, um, I had five pinball machines in my studio apartment. Are you serious? Yeah, I swear to God. They were kind of like rabbits, they kind of grew. Yeah. Do you just put your mattress on top of there? Like how do you? Uh, no, I mean I had an L-shaped studio apartment. I mean okay. reasonable space back then, and I, I kind of set them up in a particular way. And then uh, we moved into a pseudo loft space when I got married, and uh, those five machines found their way into in quotes our our major living room area. And at least for Joshua to begin with, who's older, and then Zachary, I used to put on the games for the lights and some of the animations. And, mm-hmm rock them to sleep so as i said pinball has been around them <laughs> forever when we wound up moving to a house in connecticut um i just remember uh and again i know that i'm kind of segueing here but hopefully it go ahead somewhat yeah. correlates but uh you know one of the prerequisites was that you know we needed a space for the games right um uh, which had uh not necessarily grown in number at that point in time, but was about to somehow escalate. And uh, I just remember we had gone out looking at some houses on a Sunday as a family and couldn't see all the houses that we were looking at in a town called Cheshire, Connecticut, which is outside of Waterbury and up near New Haven and Hartford. Mm -hmm. People a geographical reference point. 
and I wound up getting a call from my wife. Monday afternoon, she said, we found the house. Uh, you got to come and see it. And I met with a realtor, and it was just funny because I walked in the front door and I turned to the right, which would have ostensibly been the living room. I said, oh, this is where the pinball machine is. <laughs> well, she kind of looked at me and she said, that's what your son said, too. I said, well, yeah. I mean, I wasn't joking before, you know. You're showing me unfinished basements and things and stuff that's down in the bowels of a house. No, I mean, this is a part of our lives. Right, here. right. So just to share that's great. In, in context. Uh, yeah, everyone was on the same page That's in where family. the pinball machines did go. It sounded yeah. like everyone was on the same page in the family. Yep, they were. They kind of knew. Your pinball buck. Yeah. I want to know when you started creating that. I, I went on Amazon, and you can get a hard copy version for $250. Yep, for, for your pinball buck. Limited edition. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, only 5,000 were printed. Wow. Oh. Uh, and uh, the majority, I want to say all were personally signed, hmm. but I have encountered some over the years that uh, for some reason I, I, you I never signed them. But uh, yeah, and, and there's a story behind physically signing 5,000 books. Yeah. I do not uh, suggest. That what any, made you decide to? Uh, it was my first book. E.P. Um, Dutton was the publisher. and uh, they had the warehouse, and I was just like, well, we're doing this limited edition of the hardcover. Yeah. Um, and we'd like them to be numbered and signed. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you sign, we'll come up with a stamp, and we'll just stamp them all. And I was like, no. I mean, that's that doesn't seem right. I should personally sign all of them. Right. Drove out to Long Island to the warehouse, for the publisher, I mean, stacks and stacks is kind of like the uh, the last scene from uh, the first Indiana Jones movie, right? And it's like, and they set up a table with a light and had some, you know, markers, sharpies for me. And uh, I don't know, probably like a half hour in, maybe I had done like a few dozen or so, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what the hell have I done? <laughs> You're like, I made a mistake. <laughs> I made a mistake. Totally, I'm going to get up and stretch a little bit. At that point in time, my, my back was fine. But um, it was just arduous, and I spent uh, two days. Uh, wow. Not in the morning until, I don't know, 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night going back and signing them. So, that, again, it That's was amazing. my way of just being as honest as I possibly could be if it was going to be a signed edition. So, yes. Uh, the price of the books and some of the numbers that I have heard have astounded me for what people... What's have, the most uh, someone and, purchased it for? you know? I heard a couple of years ago that uh, the paperback, there was... Uh, we, we had three different print runs. The first one was seven ninety five. Hmm. The second one was eight ninety five. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably could have charged more, but E.P. Dutton had never done an oversized cocktail table book before. Yeah. Um, and the eight ninety five price was... You know, a little bit lower than it probably should have been and could have been. But uh, a number of years back, uh, somebody uh, came up uh, during Pinball Expo, which happens annually in Chicago. There's always an autographing session on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. uh, he had spent $500 for my 895 book. Wow. What year did you come out with the book? That was insane. Yeah, I'm was, sorry? What year did you come out with the book? What year was uh, that? 1977. Okay. And the fact that it has endured for as long as it has, and there's been other books, um, I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. I always comment that uh, it's because of the incredible visuals that uh, James Hamilton, my photographer, wound up bringing to life. Uh, very, very wonderful photographer. Just mm -hmm. great. Uh, but going back, I guess, to answer the question, why do a book on pinball? Yeah. Well, the sole motivation... And there needs to be some background to this. Are we okay on time? For yeah, you? we're good, oh. yeah. Okay. You were working at GQ Magazine at the time, right? Uh, I was, I was. Yeah. Um, so I, I I grew up pinball deprived, so there, there needs to be a, a, a reference point to all of okay. the, the insanity. Yeah, so let's go back, actually. And you're saying, I want to okay. talk about the book, but I want to go back. Well, this will to, lead to the book. Yeah, yeah. it will lead to the book. To my world of pinball. But yeah, because yeah. I want to know, you know, obviously you grew up in, in Chicago. Um, 
So when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you want to do? Oh, wow. Uh, initially? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to run in the Olympics. Really? Run? Oh, yeah. I was, uh, I was considered one of the fastest uh, runners on the south side of Chicago. We oh. had, I, I went to O'Keefe Grammar School. Okay. Um, and again, that, that part of the, the world has changed significantly. But uh, we had a shelter house. And I don't know if anybody even remembers these kinds of terms, but no, what is it? Offered uh, this is back in the fifties. Uh, shelter House offered different after school programs, if uh -huh. you will. Oh uh yeah. -huh. Well, there was a guy that maintained the Shelter House. Okay. And we we I signed up for like a track meet. You know, I was like in sixth grade, um, and he set it up with different other schools and whatever else uh, on the south side. Uh, to run meets, mm -hmm. and uh, I ran a uh, 50-yard dash, ran a 100-yard dash, I ran relays, uh, did a long jump, did a high jump. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing I did not do was a pole vault, yeah. uh, which I don't even think we even did back then. Right. And this was pre-Fosbury flop days, so uh, you have to appreciate going back in history. Right. Black and white film for anybody. Not necessarily the upcoming movie race based on the Jesse Owens story, but... Right. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was the all-purpose thing. We used to play dodgeball after school, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I was quick. I was speedy, and I was small. I was a very tiny person back back in those days, and, and we're talking under five feet. Mm -hmm. well, Being able to high jump over my height, which was wow. kind of remarkable. But all that being aside, um, yeah, I mean, I had the desire because Wheaties used to put something on to, to run in the Olympics. Right. And it was like, God, it, it would be great to do that. Now, I get a rude awakening, <coughs> excuse me, when I go to High Park High School. Right. And I am one of three white guys on the track team. Mm. I am four foot nine. I might have gotten up to 4'11". When you were a freshman? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm running against guys who are much larger. You know, we're <laughs> right. trap, whatever else. I mean, I wound up doing the low hurdles because the high hurdles for somebody like me of my stature would have been multiple high jumps. <laughs> so, uh, and the dash <laughs> no longer like a... That would be really hard to do. <laughs> yes, it would have been. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I mean... So your track uh, dreams were crushed when you were a yep. freshman in high school. So uh, the Olympics wasn't going to happen. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Um, that that was a desire of mine, uh, and it would have been good if I wasn't afraid of the ball. Uh, but I did make it to uh, – there was a junior league where you could try out again on the south side. And it embraced uh, South Shore High School and, and some other neighboring schools. And the age range was – I guess it was like 11 to 18 – as mm -hmm. a blended league. So you were actually That's playing with players ridiculous. <laughs> who were on their high school team <laughs> right. who were playing in this league. Yeah. And uh, if you didn't make the tryouts, you didn't play organized ball. You could play, you know, whatever, in backyards and right. schoolyards. Like and the sand lot or something. But there wasn't going to be a uniform or whatever else. And I actually made the team when I was 11. I played for three years and uh, had the same uniform. <laughs> Because I didn't grow. Um, but, uh, you know, I pitched. Uh, there was slow, slower, and slowest because I never wanted to really kind of let it rip because I was afraid of hurting somebody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of came to a crashing halt as well uh, in terms of my youth uh, for what I wanted to do. And then I was an exceptional bowler. I was into sports. I mean, whatever the season was, I, I think that most, most of us who grew up in Chicago, and I don't, I don't care about generational differences. I think that there's just something embedded in us mm -hmm. where you just switch. Oh, let's see. It's it's now football season. Right. We're playing football. Oh, right, exactly. Uh, now it's really terrible out. All right, we're going to play basketball, and then we switch to baseball, right. and then there's bowling. I mean, you just switch from sport to sport, and I, I tend to be very much focused on all sports. And When did uh, you first discover pinball? Um, discovered it when, uh, again, there's a section in the book that's actually somewhat true, 
uh, I went out with uh, my folks to a uh, spa in uh, Sonoma, California. Mm. Uh, my mother's family was out there, and we were out there, and it was actually the time when I learned how to swim. Uh, my aunt taught me, who had been a champion swimmer. And during the times when I wasn't in the water, <clears throat> there was actually a machine that I wound up playing, and I did step on an orange crate. It was probably a nickel to play. It was mm-hmm. not a pinball machine. It was a baseball game with a man-run unit. Mm-hmm. I, was, I mean, I was captivated. Yeah, I think I've seen those, yeah. And there was a, a, a hot water pool, small pool, and then the cold water, big, big pool, when over there they had re- actual regular pinball machines, and I was kind of overwhelmed by those, so did not really like those. I went back to the baseball game, but that was my first real exposure. I have an older sister. Uh, we would go down, she went to the University of Illinois. We'd go down for Mom's Day weekend or Dad's Day weekend or whatever else. And invariably, there was a pinball machine wherever we went out to eat or in the student union. And that's when I started playing. It was like, okay, I'm done eating my sandwich. You guys visit with Geraldine, and I'm just uh, an extra piece of the puzzle here. Nobody really wants to hear about my <laughs> life. Let's hear about Geraldine and what's happening with college and all the rest of it. So I'd go and play pinball and just, you know, loved it, enjoyed it. Would come back home and, you know, there was no pinball. And there was an arcade actually uh, by the old library on uh, Randolph and uh, Michigan Avenue, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which was the end point for the IC, Illinois Central. I don't know if it still is. Um, so I'd take the IC into Chicago, and uh, there was a game room there, and I played different games. Uh, None of them were really pinball, per se. So I did not really play until I went to college. Yeah. And you went to Wisconsin. Uh, I did go to Wisconsin. As did I. Ah, a Badger. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Different times, I'm sure, but yes, I I am. Because it was was in the Union? You saw, I think there was a story (coughs) where you, your frat brother, was playing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't at the Union, it was at, oh. uh, Burgerville or whatever, which was across from the Brat Stop. Oh, yeah, that's where I lived, right behind the Brat Stop. Okay. Yeah. Um, near the Italian restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, I started playing. Obviously, bowling was still something that I enjoyed doing. So, um, the plaza. Yeah. And, uh, bowling lanes upstairs. And you have to have a plaza burger, I mean... God, that went without saying. <laughs> uh, and that's where I started playing pinball. Uh, just, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it was absolutely terrible, atrocious. And the turning point for me was, again, watching my fraternity brother play while he ate lunch and realizing, God, there's control and there's other things and kind of made it a quest for me. Because let's face it, I mean, you go to the library, you drop off your books, and then it's like, okay, let's go. Where do I go to? KK, go to the pub, let's go have some beers, play some pinball, and then, you know, we'll make sure that we get back to the library to pick up our books from our hard evening of studying. So, yeah, I guess my one of my minors was pinball, or for some, it might have been a major. I mean, were you thinking at that time, because I remember, you know, he was doing a, like, multitasking, eating, drinking, and winning at this pinball, and you stepped up and just lost within like oh yeah a i couple just flailed minutes. i mean i've joked that you know before before he left burgerville you know all of the 10 balls had drained i, I think he made it up baskin hill a little bit halfway I'll, I'll 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 be generous um and it just it was an epiphany were you thinking that at that time are, like i'm going to be the best player in the world or what were you thinking i I think that most people, I'll generalize this, yeah. are put off by by pinball machines. Okay. Uh, depending on age and, and whatever availability or accessibility they might have had. Oh, I used to play. I don't want to play now. And, and I think it's uh, something that is potentially ingrained in any of us for any activity. Mm-hmm. We don't want to feel embarrassed. Uh, sure, We don't yeah. want to feel overly vulnerable to ridicule. Right. I'm like, oh my God, I cannot believe that you cannot beat my six-year-old niece on Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <clears throat> God, that's terrible. Right. You didn't even score a point against Anthony on ping pong? Right. Come on. Well, no, I used to play that, and I don't anymore. 
you know, I mean, think of the people, because you guys play basketball, think of the people who would like to play but don't and are watching from the sidelines or the ones who are playing with you where it's like, well, you know, let's give them the ball once. Right. Let's allow him to shoot. <laughs> That's and, me, and probably. You, and and you give him a lot of credit right. for the fact that he's there, and whether he makes up the fifth player that you needed or the third player, right. it's like, sure, we just got to have equal sides here. Yeah. You know, we'll take anybody because we're light, you know, one guy or two guys or whatever. And I, and I give people a lot of credit who are willing to go outside their comfort zone. So for pinball, it wasn't this this concept because to me there was no world that was outside of that immediate world of pinball there were some competitions i know um subsequently that were taking place and so on but it wasn't like i'm going to be the best at this i just wanted to get to a point where i knew that it was me controlling my own destiny rather than the games right that i could achieve some semblance of of skill an accomplishment. Much the same way, I mean, I never fancied myself to be the best bowler in the world, but I knew I was damn good. Baseball, the same, I knew that I could hold my own, despite, again, my fear of a hardball just hurting me. Yeah. Uh, running, you know, <clears throat> it was quickly pointed out that, uh, yes, at this level, guess what? The Olympics is not going to happen, but I'm still damn fast. And I can still surprise people, and I'm still going to compete my ass off. And I think that that's always been my my nature when it comes to mm. sports. I mean, right. my sister took tennis lessons, and I would routinely beat her. Right. And if it hadn't been a situation where I was working, I would have been on a high school tennis team. Uh, it wasn't that I was the best, but, hey, I'm damn good. And the same with basketball. I mean... It was the same with all sports, so I think I viewed pinball the same way of like, all right, I can do this now. And, you know, I've kind of talked about and described just the the painful experience. Uh, You know, I'd pull back a plunger and start flipping madly. The ball wasn't even close to the flippers. (laughs) You're just getting exercise. (laughs) Absolutely. I am just being this lunatic person flipping, and then suddenly, you know, and this is prior to... Uh, even watching uh, my suddenly it was like oh you know what I don't have to flip like a crazy person until the ball is somewhat close so the ball is up there bouncing around suddenly it comes down toward the flippers and now I'm flipping furiously right. and, and there's another little light bulb that goes off and it's like you know I don't have to flip both flippers if the ball is to the left I can just flip one if the ball is to the right I can just flip one I mean, those were the stages for me. Right. It was just a question of knowing, okay, I can flip at this point in time. Aiming and doing anything, I don't, I'm just flipping. Let me get the ball as far away from here as I possibly can, up somewhere in the play field, and, and let it bounce around until it comes back down again, and maybe I can time it. That's the level of player right. I was. Right. I, there, there was no sophistication, if you will. Yeah. There was no depth to anything more than just that approach. Then watching, suddenly I went back to that game, realizing I can aim. You know, You're I can right. control somewhat the general vicinity of where I can hit that ball to. Yeah, I mean, speaking and, of and aiming, that process. You know, speaking of aiming, you know, if someone hasn't seen the episode of Drunk History, that it is. <laughs> completely dedicated to you they should check it out it's it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic and actually. please take it with a grain of salt it's fantastic <laughs> so i want to f- go back to and, and kind of find the accuracy of that uh, i'm sure they checked did their fact checking but um they never but, talked to me but yes they ahead. didn't i'm surprised no actually. oh god no i'm surprised uh, why why do you think uh, i don't know they think you say no or something or uh, <laughs> you he, find out later you have this whole episode on drunk history about you uh, I did I find out later. I mean, Mysteries of the Museum, which was on, I guess, Discovery or History Channel or whatever else, they did reach me. Hmm. Uh, we weren't able to coordinate things for them to either, I don't know, interview me, get me on camera, or God only knows what. There, they, they the segment that they did was a little bit seedier, <laughs> a little less satisfying to me. Okay. 
uh, plus the bad wig that the guy had, the bad fake mustache. And the mustache was great, I thought. Uh, no, I'm talking about uh, oh. Mysteries in the Museum. Yes, oh, I get the, you. I the, get the you. hair style and whatever else for the guy in Drunk History, sure. Yeah, that was fantastic. Kind of, that was kind of fun. W- at what point did they outlaw pinball? Uh, 1941 in New York City. Okay. And actually in Chicago. And so... Uh, amazing and and a variety of other towns and cities so it's his equivalent like alcohol craft. like that's how bad it is for people pinball it's only uh, it was, is that the I only mean, prohibition <laughs> uh, well, you know i mean we I, I guess there were prohibitions on on games you yeah. know subsequently but that's crazy. for pinball it was you know stealing you know lunch money uh it was gambling mm-hmm. uh the mob was controlling uh, all these pennies and nickels oh my god um, so this, there were uh, many different, again, towns and cities, the most notorious obviously being Fiorello LaGuardia in New York, taking an axe to machines right. and dumping them in the East River. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we tend to live in a society that uh, looks at things in peculiar ways. Uh, rock and roll music in the 50s with Elvis Presley, it's terrible. Right. Oh, my God, what's it doing? I mean, rap music. You know, it's misogynistic, and it's this, and it's that. This is terrible. Right. Uh, the hippie generation in the 70s. Oh, my God, psychedelic music, and uh, it's free love, and, and right. girls are burning their bra. I mean, this is terrible. Right. Uh, children are congregating in a schoolyard. Something bad is going on. We don't know what it is, but we don't want them to be there. Right. Uh, we're going to have rules and regulations as to how many children can be at the mall on a Saturday. Right. Congregating. Uh, you know, I mean, all of these things wind up emerging, I've always thought, whether it's lawmakers or, or people that are in positions of uh, significant either power or influence, based on whatever they wound up experiencing when they were younger, and God forbid, other people should do what they were doing. <laughs> My gosh. So, so let's, let's outlaw, ban it, or, or come up with some kind of controls and restrictions. What made them call you, then, in that, uh, in, so, was it 76? In 1976. Yeah, who'd, yes. they, who'd you get the call from? What'd they say? Uh, it was the uh, Music and Amusement Operators Association of, uh, of New York. Yeah. Um, I had uh, done a uh, piece for GQ Magazine, and maybe this kind of goes as to you know how everything kind of started. All yeah. Right. So I, I majored or minored in pinball uh, throughout my uh, <laughs> matriculating in college. Uh, I moved to New York to start a career in, in advertising, and uh, there's no pinball. So I go from ignorance to uh, feast to famine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's no pinball. And it's like, okay, not really liking this at all. Uh, my career shifts to uh, become associate editor of Gentleman's Quarterly Magazine. And now I'm in a position of being able to um, either take on stories myself or bring in writers to write certain stories. And I thought, hmm, if I do a feature on pinball machines, I will meet the right people and I will be able to buy my own game. That was the sole motivation and purpose. You just wanted your own game. That's all that I would yeah. did. I mean, what has emerged over the past, you know, 40 plus years is an outgrowth of wanting my own game. I told people this <laughs> numerous occasions, and, and I think it holds true for any of us in our lives, uh, whatever we choose to do, uh, whatever we had an endo- a desire and an ambition to want to do. Mm-hmm. And some of that is the same. Maybe it changes you know, over a course of time for whatever the reasons are. If I had grown up in Chicago um, without pinball, okay, it, and maybe I would have, you know, played it a little bit in college because that's what we were doing uh, when we went out drinking and partying and whatever else. And if I had never seen my fraternity brother play, probably wouldn't have meant anything. And if I would have then moved to New York without pinball, it would have been like, okay, it's not there. No change, and, yeah. And there would have been no change at all to anything. And, you know, my life would have taken on undoubtedly a different path. So... Having said that, sometimes the pieces that are in play that shape what we wind up doing are ones that uh, we maybe never thought of or anticipated. So 
So wanting my own game mm -hmm. led me to want to do a feature in GQ. I, and I had done some other writing, you know, along the way, not the least of which was, uh, oh, is, sorry for my dog barking. You okay? Um, not the least of which was uh, when IRAs first came out, and I'll just use this as an example. <coughs> uh, Eugene Keogh was a congressman from New York who created the Keogh Plan. <coughs> and everybody was talking about saving money and uh, retiring as a millionaire, God only knows, whatever. And I thought, God, this, is, this would be great. Let me see if I can reach his office and go in and interview him. Because might as well go to the source. Right. I called up. I, I got a time to, to go in and interview him. And I remember meeting this, this congressman and was so appreciative. I said, I am sure that, God, you know, New York Times and everybody else under the sun has probably come in, and I don't want to take up your time. I'm just here for GQ, you know, magazine. And uh, what he recounted to me was the fact that I was the first person to come and actually talk to him. Mm. There were features in whether it was Fortune Magazine or anything else, there were all these features, but nobody had taken the time really? early on yeah. to actually meet with the person who developed this entire you know, program for retirement savings. Wow. So, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. So, I tend to be very referential and, and wanting to do whenever I've done any writing at all, and, and I've written or contributed to 14 books, so it's not just my pinball book. Right. So the first thing that I did was I went to the New York Public Library on 42nd and 5th because I've now assigned myself this you know, feature on <laughs> all machines and right. go into the stacks and look up pinball. And I, I'm thinking of any and all words, flippers and, and tilt and whatever, to see uh, where are the books. Because the first piece I ever did for uh, GQ came about as a freelance. I had sat down, and I'm still in advertising as a copywriter and an account exec, and had won some awards, which was great. Um, but, you know, as I had mentioned before, I was tired of losing people after a headline in a paragraph. I really had a desire to, to write. Did you have any favorite copywriters that you followed at the time, like getting into copywriting? No, but, mm. you know, I mean, this is an era uh, back in the uh, 70s of uh, Jerry Delafamina, George Lois, uh, God, uh, Mary Green from Wells Rich and Green. I mean, this is one of the, the golden eras of, of, of advertising. Yeah. A little bit post-Mad Men. Right, right. But somewhat very true to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was just a remarkable time. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily belabor that. But, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate to, to land what I landed when I did. Yeah. Um, and having someone who was an incredible mentor at the time to get me through some tough times. Um, but, again, uh, so you went 55 into the letters to yeah. 55 different magazines, publications, asking what the procedures were for submitting story ideas. And each one had to be individually typed because I'm somewhat anal and idiosyncratic that way. So it wasn't like I was running them off on a mimeograph machine or whatever else. Each one laboriously, I guess, see, I never learned. I just thought of this. I've never said this before in the context. You would think that doing 55 letters on my IBM Selectric would have been reason enough for me to say, okay, I'm not going to sign 5,000 books. <laughs> just saying. I mean, it wasn't an afternoon escapade of like, all right, let's type this letter up. Let's type this. I mean, it was a period of weeks right. for it to get through all of this stuff so I could, you know, personally sign each one of those 55 letters. I got three responses back. Two were on my own letter saying thanks, but no thanks. Right. There's always a daunting kind of obstacle. One was on personalized stationery from uh, who I would ultimately find to be the managing editor of GQ, saying if I knew anything about tires, wheels, bicycles, or cars, <laughs> call this number. <gasps> sure. 
That's the opening you needed. Finally, the summer before, I had uh, worked with a couple of my dear friends' brothers who had started a bicycle pack business Mm. out in Southern California. So I went in for my meeting with the then editor and managing editor of GQ, which at that time was the the week sister publication of Esquire. Mm-hmm. Um, and they held up two ads. One was a $99 bicycle from Sears, and another one was, I don't know, a $1,000 bike or whatever. And so what's the difference? And I just spit it out some words. Uh, it's Molivin and Frames and Campanella Brakes and, I mean, other stuff. I didn't know what the heck I was Was that the about. interview at that point? Uh, that was, um, no, that was actually, well, it was me going in, and them determining whether or not I was the right person to assign the story to. Okay. And what they wanted was uh, about, I don't know, 2,500 words on everything anybody would need to know about buying a 10-speed bicycle. Yeah. And it's like, okay. So when I threw out my choice words, it was like, well, you seem to know everything. Great. Here's what the, you know, what the fee is and the deadline and, you know, go for it. And I was still in advertising, and uh, Crocs and Mercantiles was a bookstore that was renowned back then and uh, had a couple of wonderful stores actually in Chicago, but there was one on uh, Fifth Avenue in New York, and I went from the GQ office uh, directly to uh, Crocs and Mercantiles and bought $88 worth, worth of books on bicycles, and that's what I used as my reference. To turn in, I did something that was totally unfathomable and it's terrible and should never do it. I turned in a 19-page manuscript. Whoa. Uh, three months early. And said, here's my rough draft. Let me know what you think. So out of that, I wound up getting three more assignments and ultimately wound up being offered a, a, a job uh, at the magazine. So, again, not knowing anything, I bought books. Uh, I wrote a story. I actually gave it to a bicycle shop owner that I knew uh, off of uh, 2nd Avenue and uh, around 23rd Street in New York City and said, here, take a look at this. Tell me if it makes sense at Mm -hmm. all. Because I don't know. He came back and said, looks great. I was like, okay, cool. (laughs) Thanks. So the same notion existed when I was on staff for Pinball. I, I got to do some reference. I don't know where to start with any of this. I don't know any history or anything else. I'm totally clueless. All I know is I am going to get a pinball machine. I'm very excited. I'm going to buy one because I'm going to meet people. So right. I started uh, meeting some people, going to my first trade show. And this would have been in, uh, actually the first one was 74, but it would have been 1975. Um, the Living It Up issue came out from GQ uh, in the winter of 1975, and it featured not just pinball. It, I wound up expanding the scope of the story for a variety of reasons. But at that point in time, uh, I, I guess I already had some notoriety. Uh, I had met up with uh, the son of the then president of Williams at a distributorship in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And uh, was that the bi- one of the biggest companies at the time? Uh, at the time, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, his name is Gary Stern. He now runs Stern Pinball. Uh, but uh, I approached him because I the, I saw a new game that they had. It was a game called Big Ben, 1975, and started asking questions about the design. I have a photographic memory, which really now, yeah now tends to falter from bit to bit. Just there's too much stuff that's locked up in there. But I had started doing enough, you know, research and had traveled enough down the Jersey Shore and other places to have, you know, become a bit more familiar with, uh, with pinball. Um, and effectively um, asked him, so the design of this game, which is a lot like, and I rattled off four other games. So when you guys are designing these, is that what you're thinking? And he was just shell-shocked. Mm-hmm. And uh, a few weeks later, I wound up traveling out for uh, the Coin Opera and Amusement Game Industry Show, which was at that time uh, held at the uh, Palmer House Hilton uh, 
in downtown Chicago. Yeah. And I encountered Gary and, you know, hi, how are you? Oh, this is Roger Sh- Ask him anything about pinball. This guy knows everything. Oh, my God, he'll tell you how the games were designed and this, that, and the other thing. And I made my, mm. uh, I guess I made my introductions to a number of people that I would subsequently uh, interview for my book. Okay. Uh, some of them who were, in quotes, first generation hires back in the 30s when the industry really kind of took off and uh, and elsewhere. So with that being said, um, yes, at that point in time, I was somewhat accomplished as a player. I liked to show off a lot. <laughs> How so? I was so good. And I would just, you know, I would kind of, you know, you're at a trade show, it's the booth. They have a couple of games lined up. And it's uh. like, okay, let me put the game through its paces. Here, let me make this shot. Oh, let me just do this. And, you know, kind of keep people spellbound because right. of the way that I was playing. So, so, so anyway, at that point in time, people knew because I was then starting to work on doing research for my book, which admittedly took three years to, to pull together. Wow, yeah. Um, where the association knew of me. Uh, I think the crowning point was I did a feature for the New York Times that appeared at the end of 1975, and they approached me and uh, said uh, they wanted me to testify because there was an opportunity to overturn, you know, the ban that had been in place for 35 years. Now, I'll segue back for a minute. Yeah. Uh, because the book really came about in an interesting way. I'm just doing research for a pinball feature you just all along we just want a, your own pinball machine <laughs> right so I'm, I'm back to the library story right uh, because I think it all knits together in some some way shape or form um, I find that there is one piece that was done in 1972 by Tony Lucas who had won a Pulitzer not for that one story on pinball that's it there's no book or anything else right and I go back disheartened because I tell the editor, um, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer for me to pull this together because there's no books. I mean, right. you know, I'm back in my, my bicycle 10-speed mode of, you know, where are all the books that I can buy so right. I can read up, take notes, and figure out, you know, where to go from here. Yeah. Uh, you know, Eugene Keel is easy. It's a Keel plan. It's got to be somebody somewhere. Mm-hmm with that name, or God only knows what. I mean, we didn't have the internet back then or anything else, so, you know, the ability to really kind of do research was uh, a little bit more uh, arduous. Oh, yeah, for sure. And my editor said, well, you think you know so much, why don't you write a book? Ha, 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 ha. And I went back to my office laughing, and that was the, I guess, inspiration for saying hi. As I started to kind of really discover my first inquiries, Mm-hmm. Who to reach out to? Um, how to network, if you will. Um, I'm doing research for uh, a piece in GQ and maybe a book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And eventually, mm-hmm. it was you know the piece in GQ, and when I was able to get a publisher and they were able to buy into the concept, a book. So again, needing that just as a backdrop, foundation. So these. State Association knew that I was working on a book, knew that I was doing interviews, knew yeah. that I was a somewhat accomplished player. At that point in time, I had already done my traveling around the world, if you will, at least Europe, yeah. and the United States, taking pictures, interviewing people, and so on. Wow. Uh, so they uh, <sighs> approached me and said, would I be willing to testify? That it's so New York story. Times called you? No. After the New York Times piece. Oh. Uh, the New York Times piece came about because the art director of my book was a fellow by the name of George Del Marico, incredibly talented, who was the art director for the Arts and Leisure section of the Times. Mm. And also was uh, art directing for the Village Voice. Okay. James Hamilton, my photographer, was staff photographer basically for the Voice and had come on board uh, as a brilliant photographer and took on the task of uh, doing the photography I needed for my pinball feature in the magazine and we kind of hit it off and it was like, so uh, would you be willing if I can do it to work on a pinball book and travel with me? And two young people, it was like, sure. It wasn't a hard sell. No. 
Nope. So, uh, again, that's how it came about, and uh, was called into uh, the city council meeting. Uh, 1972, Bess Meyerson was then the commissioner of consumer affairs in New York City, yeah. and uh, the association was able to bring in what I would define as pinball light. So there were kind of like pseudo pinball machines that were in operation mm -hmm. in, in the city, not the ones that were placed as I was finding in the village or elsewhere illegally, so I could get you know some pinball to play or an adult bookstore, God only knows what. Right. Uh, there was an, Let's talk about that for one second because I read this article and it just made me laugh. Um, when you're in New York, because there's certain places you can play pinball, which I would not have expected. Uh, certain places where pinball could be found that was being mm -hmm. operated illegally. Right. Yes. In, in adult bookstores. Uh, one of them happened to be an adult bookstore. So I was living in New Jersey and commuting into New York. Right. Uh, I was working at uh, NWR. Uh, they were up in Burlington House, uh, which was uh, 55th and 6th Avenue. I would get into Port Authority, and I didn't know how to take subways or anything else, and I would walk from Port Authority up to 55th Street. Mm -hmm. And I would go different ways. Sometimes it would be 8th Avenue, sometimes 9th, sometimes whatever, to get there. And then I would time it to go back, um, to get the bus to go back home. And uh, I guess one particular day, I walked down 6th Avenue. I made a right on 42nd Street. I am about one-third of the way down the block, where out of the corner of my ear, I want a familiar sound. And the familiar sound was pinball. I was just like, okay. Well, we're not going to take the 610 home tonight. <clears throat> uh, I turned back around, and I, look, I'm, I was not back then uh, any type of a prude or whatever else. But I never felt safe going into an adult bookstore, which, you know, all the windows were always kind of, you know, blacked out. And right. What's going on back there? And I, I you know, look, I'm this somewhat naive little Jewish person from <laughs> the Midwest. Right? You don't want to walk in and they like, never, right. never and, walk and, out. And be killed, thing. right. And right. Like, oh, my God, my, yeah. my parents, the horror. I mean, the first time, all right, I'll, again. Don't, don't mind me as I kind of go off on tangents. Go ahead. <laughs> so my, my first bus ride into the city for my first day on the job, get in the Port Authority, and I am walking down the street. Now, I have to understand, and maybe some of this still holds true. I've always believed this, and, and if it's inaccurate, then I, I stand corrected. But, you know, Midwesterners, Chicagoans, I, I have a deep love of Chicago, but... We tend to, you know, walk with our heads up, and we look at people, you know, in the face. <laughs> and and whether you smile or acknowledge or not, it's it's not as if we cower and kind of try to go invisibly on our way. Right. It's just the nature of the beast. Right. I'm I'm getting off my first day. And I'm all excited, and I'm walking up. Um, I guess it was Eighth Avenue, and this guy comes up. And he is mumbling something, and I do not understand what the heck he is saying. And I am just walking, and he is walking next to me. A vagrant, obviously. <laughs> and he uh, took me three blocks before I understood that he wanted money from me. And I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and one of my lessons, because I share that with the people, and I was like, well, you, you, you don't catch their eye. The minute you catch their eye, they got you. Mm. Just avert your attention. I you see. can look from a distance, but the minute there's eye contact, if it's somebody that wants to, you know, hit you up for money or God only knows what, you're, you're gone. You're lost. Like, yeah. And I, plus, I couldn't understand anything. So I want to use that in the context of, <clears throat> again, here's this peep show. I'm hearing some sound. Um, the, the window is not totally blacked out, so I kind of see the legs or part of the legs of the pinball machines in the front of Yes, I gotta go in here. <laughs> I go in. I think they probably had like four pinball machines lined up. <clears throat> excuse me, backed up to the front window. 
and I go to get change, and behind the guy sitting at the booth is, you know, a black curtain that leads to, you know, whatever the, the movies are that are being played and, and the peep show stuff back there. Right. There's a couple of businessmen who have their briefcases down playing in their suits, and it's like, okay, this is home. <laughs> Uh, and that became uh, a daily ritual for me. Uh, there were times where I was like, you know what? Let me go down and play some pinball during lunch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think I have time. So my, my path to work absolutely became Port Authority, 42nd Street to 6th Avenue, make a left and walk all the way up. I'd probably play a game or two in the morning, depending on timing, weather, and whatever else. Maybe in the afternoon and then at night. One of those occasions, whatever time it might have been, I remember going in, and the games were all disassembled and on the side. And by then, I kind of knew the guy, you know, getting my quarters and whatever else. Right. I was up to him, I was just like, what, what happened? And they came in, and they busted us. <laughs> oh, what? And I remember just being incredulous and right. saying, wait, 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 wait. Uh, I don't know what goes on back there, pointing to, you know, where the, the movie stuff was. Right. But pinball, they busted you? Right. And he just kind of shrugged, yep. And I was like, okay, thanks. Bizarre. So my path changed, and at one point in time, I was down in the village, probably right. around the same time frame. Um, and uh, so this is, you know, 1972. I mean, this is pre GQ and everything else. Uh, so I found a place uh, that was like a head shop record store where they had pinball machines buried in the back and just happened to be in there. I think I was looking for, for records. I wasn't there for the <coughs> water pipes or anything else um, and found pinball and that became my haven as well. So I just uh, have you had, I had to have you tell that story before talking about the testifying thing because, you know, the fact that you know, it's an adult bookstore, there's peep shows, and they come in and confiscate and raid because of the pinball. <laughs> it's just... Right. So, so again, going back to it, Bess Meyerson, 72, is able to get some reform done, but not significant. By 1976, <coughs> excuse me, Eleanor Guggenheim is now the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, and she is inclined, now I understand this is pre-video games coming out, she is inclined because there's some playlands and whatever else in Midtown and there's uh, you know an arcade down in Chinatown and, and other spots. She is inclined to allow pinball to be brought back. Hmm. And Eugene Masterpier is a congressman who is advancing a bill for this to happen. So uh, that is what uh, the setup was. And they needed somebody who was uh, not encumbered by actually being part of the industry so i became uh, the choice for it right so you go in to testify and what happened i go in to testify the uh, the court is filled uh there's camera crews and everything else i i'm somewhat claustrophobic um, really yeah yeah i mean again part of my own neuroses um and when I saw what the courtroom was like, it was like, oh, I can't do this. <laughs> right. I would have walked out. Forget it. Uh, All the, did no, you realize I, how much pressure was on your shoulders at the time? I mean... Well, it wasn't the pressure. That didn't oh, bother me It wasn't. All. Okay. No, it was a fact of feeling trapped. Oh. What happens if I have to go to the bathroom when I'm, I'm testifying? I mean, I could be trapped sitting down in a chair. It right. was, I mean, if anything, the saving grace was when I got a chance to actually play. I got to stretch, get up, and right. show off. And I remember Rufus King, uh, one of the industry attorneys, a marvelous guy, uh, was very helpful when I was putting uh, my book together and doing research. Uh, he had actually been uh, one of the principal attorneys for the Keith Offer Commission case back in 1956 to help uh, articulate a law that uh, basically established the difference between amusement-only pinball machines and those that were, in fact, uh, games of uh, gambling if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Rufus just said, hey, you're going to go, it's, it's easy. I mean, I'd never testified in a court before. I'm right. Like, Great. I, I mean, they're going to ask you questions. You have all the answers. Come on, then you get to play. You right. can do this. They just now, want you to play. And if, and if yeah. you, you need to take a break, you just say, hi, oh, excuse me for a minute, and you take a break. Right. Really? 
okay, cool, because that's not how it is on TV. <laughs> right. I see Perry Mason grilling people. <laughs> they don't get off the stands. I watch the defenders of E.G. Marshall. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, so went in, and, uh, you know, it, it was just interesting because the, the person that was uh, chairing the, uh, the city council committee was very gruff and very adversarial and antagonistic to me. I mean, the first questions after was, I was sworn in, you know, who are you and whatever else. And, all right, so who's, who paid you to be here today? Uh, huh? Um, nobody. I mean, in the back of my mind, it's like, you mean I could have gotten paid? <laughs> in here? Excuse me? I mean, uh, understand that you're working on a book? Uh, who's paying for that? Well, uh, E.P. Dutton's the publisher. You know, which of the manufacturers is behind that? None. So, I mean, it started off like that. Yeah. And then the testimony continued for a while. There were two games that were brought in. Uh, I did not have any choice over the games, so I'll make that clear up front. Yeah. And it didn't matter to me. It would have been any game. Um, again, being somewhat confident or without uh, some level of modesty. Right. right. <clears throat> but um, there was a game called El Dorado, and then there was another game called uh, Bank Shot. Both got lead games. Um, and the reason for two games in the court was it's a pinball machine. If something goes wrong, at least we have a backup. Right. Okay. But this is going to be the designated game. So we get to the point, and again, I've answered questions from everybody, but principally from this one guy. To kind of talk about the history of the industry, the involvement of the mob, and it's like, seriously, really know whatever the Hollywood version is, based on my excessive amount of interviews and copious research into the history right. of traveling around Europe and the United States and so on, and meeting with all the manufacturers, no, 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 no. Yeah. And so on. So kind of going through that litany, I get up because he said, I guess it's now you're going to be showing us that, you know, it's a game of skill. You know, like, ha, ha, ha. And I went and I turned and was going over to El Dorado. And this guy in a way that I guess would be comparable to the scene from uh, Charlton Heston standing on the mountain and parting the sea. Bands up you know, whatever height he was, 5'8 or something, and points, not that game, that game. He thought you had, he had you there. Oh, he thought that that one was rigged or whatever else, so of course there was like a 20-minute recess because all the TV news crews and everybody else, you know, photographers had to reset their lighting. And I went to the Bank Shot game, which, and I've said this in the past when, when asked, was an easier game for me to describe the skill factor of design and layout. El Dorado had its own unique intrinsic qualities, but El Dorado was also Target Alpha, was also, you know, a variety of other names, Solar City. It was just, you know, paint artwork change on a play field. Right. Was there skill involved in the gameplay? Yes, I could have done that, you know, easily. Bank Shot. My God, Bank Shot was a pool-based game, and the targets all corresponded to different pool balls. Mm. So intrinsically, the nature of the theme was such that I was able to kind of, you know, explain the mindset and concept of design, the kinetics of, uh, of laying out a play field, what the rule sets and objectives were. I need to finish all of this in order to fill out my, you know, rack of pool balls. Right. Very, very basic. And played two balls, making shots, calling shots, cradling the ball on the flipper and saying, okay, now see the, sh the, the light flashing up there? I want to make that shot. Boom. Make it. Okay? And so on. I remembered in doing some of the research and actually traveling close to home in Skokie, Illinois, just south of Old Orchard, there was a bowling alley. It's not there anymore. Uh, they had... Um, some pinball machines. The ruling, I guess, in Skokie was that a plunger was a chance gambling part of the game. Mm. They took out the plunger and put it in, with, if you've played pinball recently or are familiar with it, uh, put it in an automatic shooter, mm -hmm. which I hated. On the games today that feature them, it's okay because they're designed that way. The games back then, in the 70s, were not designed that way, and I just hated it. Right. So before I sent the third ball up, 
I remember the plunger. Got to get everything in here that I can. Right. Let me spotlight. So, there's five lanes on top corresponding to pool balls. And the layout of the game, again, if you take a look at it, you'll see what I mean. There's no real shots back up to the top. So what I impressed upon them was I said, unless you get some bumps and nudges from the jet bumpers just below, it's a five-ball game. There's five lanes on top. And in order to fulfill what the objective is, you need to get all five lanes, you know, lit, mm, right. unlit, if you will. So, and see the gradient lines down here for the plunger? Well, this corresponds to, you know, this is skill. Because if I pull it back just right and so on and so forth, I can accurately <clears throat> send the ball up and know approximately where it's going to go. I said, but if I pull this back just right, it will go down the center. Right. Right. Now, you know, maybe Babe Ruth and his infinite wisdom uh, really did know that he could do whatever he could do and thought about it ahead of time just to, you know, shut everybody up in the opposing dugout. I don't know. Um, I just did what I did based on the fact that I knew in the back of my mind if I needed to, I'm going to be somewhat close. I can talk my way through it. Um, I can nudge the darn ball into that center lane. But instead, with some divine intervention, and truthfully, not with any lack of skill, not to diminish my interaction with the plunger, I pulled back the plunger, it went up, it hit a rubber stop, which is part of the game, made this beautiful, wonderful, magnificent arc, and just dropped straight down. I mean, you play the basketball. I switched it. Right. I had nothing but wire form <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> going That's down. That's the name of your next book. But not the sides yeah. or anything. Just like, boom, straight down. It was like, yes. And uh, the guy, again, the gruff person, if you've seen any of the pictures of uh, this kind of short squat person. Just, ah, that's it. You've seen enough. Of it. I'm still playing here. <laughs> but that was uh, basically the end of the test. I called my shot. Right. Even though it wasn't a shot, it was a plunge. Right. I had already called multiple shots. Oh, here, I got the 11-12. I want to hit this one. Right. Over here. Boom. I'm going to do it from the backhand. Boom. I'm going to do it from the forehand. Right to left, left to right, right to right, left to right. left. It didn't matter. I was just, I was in my element. I was showing it off. Right. So, um, so that is the story of the called shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, the so voted six to zero well. to uh, allow pinball back in, and as I've always thought, uh, it was kind of nice. I, I know they didn't do it on purpose. Then Mayor Abe Bean, on uh, my birthday, August first, signed it into law, and pinball was allowed back into uh, New York. The manufacturers of the pinball machines must have loved you. Yeah, I kind of opened up a new market for them. I actually testified. In Columbus, Ohio, with the Attorney General, uh, I helped out in a couple of cases in the South, something out in the West Coast, and actually offered some assistance to uh, the overturning in Chicago yeah. to allow pinball back in Cook County. Yeah. yeah. And you've done some amazing things as well in the licensing world for the pinball yeah. machines. Can you talk about what's been one of the most successful or proudest licensing deals that you were able to put together? There's been any number of them, obviously, and, and for those who aren't aware, um, yeah, I mean, licensing was something that occurred, at least in the world of coin-operated amusement games, back in the mid to late 70s. It actually put Valley Pinball on the map. Um, had a, a tremendous impact. Um, you know, when the industry kind of went dormant for a while, when video games took over in uh, the late 70s, very early 80s, and companies like D. Gottlieb, uh, Williams Electronics, Bally, Chicago Coin, and and, and back then uh, Stern Electronics were kind of taking it hard. Who were uh, they competing against? Like Atari, or who was who was? Well, in? yeah, Atari was out there. Atari actually started doing pinball. Uh, oh, really? Recently, Sega, Namco, uh, Nintendo. I mean, you had this confluence of everybody saying, hey, "We have mall game rooms, Aladdin's castles, and like." that existed back then, uh, they needed to be populated with machines. So uh, pinball kind of fell 
to the background because of this new phenomenon called video games where you were actually interacting with ostensibly a TV, a TV screen. Right. Whether it was vector or raster graphics to play Space Invaders or Pac-Man or other games from that era, there was a fascination of people wanting to have that kind of experience where pinball was, again, kind of intimidating, a little bit off-putting, and a little bit to pay some tribute to an old Ozobiel campaign. Uh, this is your grandfather's pinball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We want new technology, even though the technology of pinball back then was new. It was electromechanical before it had gone to solid state. So, again, um, what wound up emerging uh, was uh, a new breed of uh, pinball machines in new locations. Um, and uh, when I came on board uh, in 1988 and made the move from the East Coast back home, if you will, uh, I believe in brand licensing. Right. Uh, suggested it, uh, much to the uh, chagrin and uh, the negative reaction from uh, the corporate executives at Williams, uh, because we were about to uh, purchase, in fact, we did, the amusement game division from Valley of Valley Midway, and as was told to me, look where it got them. I was like, well, that, but that was before. And I, I think that there's room for it, so... Elvira was the first brand license that I worked on, and working with Cassandra was just a real treat. Yeah. Uh, the game was a remarkable success. Uh, the introduction of it at a trade show was something that was beyond my imagination. What, did it, what was it like? Oh, God, the seas parted. Uh, the, the trade show took place actually at uh, what was then the uh, Hilton it's now the Westgate, but it's attached to the convention center in Las Vegas in their convention area. And uh, we had two games uh, set up, one for Williams and one for Bally. One was Police Force. The other was Bally. had kind of outfitted the booth into this kind of regal place for uh, Cassandra to sit. So she uh, was there, like... She was there in person. De debuting and, with the... And we... Uh, we had an entourage bring her in, and uh, because Police Force was the Williams game, uh, I had outfitted uh, the crew, myself included, into, like, police guard. So, and we had actual real, you know, police-type people as well, but here we are, all of us, uh, mm -hmm. bringing her in, and I wanted to make certain, because back then it was a very large, it was much larger than the show has become, um, we wanted to make sure that we went down every darn aisle <laughs> until we got to our booth. Right. That's great. This conga line comes in, the seas. I mean, part. she's... Oh, my God, I mean, here that, she is. that picture on the pinball machine. Is, I'm sorry? That, I mean, the picture of her on the pinball machine is um, probably a good sight for a pinball player to be uh, working For in. almost anybody, yes. Right. I, mean, I yeah. forget. It could have been Hulk Hogan who was there. It didn't matter. I mean, it was like all eyes and everybody's kind of moving. And we get to the booth. There was a line, probably like a line waiting outside an Apple store for the latest and greatest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember and, and getting her to, to sit on, you know, in, in her throne that we had set up with spider webs and all sorts of other stuff to, to sign autographs. We had pictures, you know, done for a sign. I remember going up to the the first person in line, this is a trade show, this is a business show. These are location owners and operators and distributor salespeople who are looking at the latest and greatest technologies, the latest and greatest games and attractions right. to make purchase decisions for their livelihood. Right. This is not an insignificant time to just kind of kick back because it's finite time for the three-day show. Right. And I remember going up to the first guy and they just said, how, how long have you been waiting here? Uh, three and a half hours. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Okay. Okay, great. I knew I had a hit. I knew that it was a beyond belief. Cassandra was marvelous uh, to uh, really kind of uh, be there for, for everybody in line uh, to sign autographs and just be, you know, this fantastic person for us. Um, so that was a cherished memory of my first license being the success that it That's was. That's amazing. So that was your first license. Yeah. Wow. Uh, 
the first one on the video game side was wow. uh, NBA Jam. I, there's a video of you on YouTube of playing NBA Jam. Oh, you, you of know the that? actual playing of it? Of the or? actual game, yeah. Of the actual oh, of me being game. one of the hidden yes, characters? Exactly. Yes, I am. Yes. I am in that and also NFL Blitz. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes. So, NBA Jam only because uh, no professional sports league had ever done a license for a coin-operated amusement game. Mm-hmm. So I had to start from scratch to, to get the NBA to agree. How did that work? How did you do that? It was about a year and a half and just kind of uh, giving them... And again, I come from a position of some credibility based on, you know, whatever my... I don't know. Whatever my reputation has been. Can you just send them the link to Drunk History and then they'll <laughs> do a deal with you? Yeah, really, back then? <laughs> that would have been good. No, but for the NBA, it was like, there's this great opportunity and this is who we are as a company and yeah. this is who we are reaching out there um and uh so i think those those two just because they were first and yeah. proved to be as successful uh subsequent to that uh the monopoly license for slot machines uh for wms gaming uh that took me seven years to close wow seven years yep but i tend to be somewhat persistent <laughs> in, in in believing in something that's right, right, right. and trying to make sure that any antiquated views, any stigma attached to allowing imagery to be on a pinball machine or a video game or a slot machine. Uh, I just want the decisions, good, better, and differently, to be made for the right reasons. Yeah. And not because the thought is, oh, my God, this is terrible. This is taking you know, lunch money from children. Uh, this is uh, taking uh, benefits from uh, the elderly. You know, the, the world changes. And as it changes, uh, you know, you try to be there to provide, you know, wisdom and guidance and hopefully build trust. Right. So that Wizard of Oz, um, I take a lot of pride in being able to achieve that. And, you know, there are any number of, you know, other stories, other projects that uh, I take uh, an incredible amount of satisfaction in being able to, to make them all happen. What I mean, took so long with the monopoly? Why do you why do you think it took? Oh, because there had not been licensing. I started in ninety one talking to them. Mm -hmm. There was no licensed content in the world of slot machines back then. Mm, wow. We were not a slot machine company necessarily. We were still a pinball and video game company. We were moving toward becoming a slot machine company. Yeah. But you know, this is pre Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. Uh, um, so. Starting from scratch, uh, getting the belief of the company executives that, you know, it's working in Coinop. So if we're going to, you know, do something. And I had started conversations with Hasbro to uh, do a Monopoly themed pinball machine. So the segue into the other. And it was just a question of comfort level, it was a question of believing mm -hmm. enough with uh, Alan Hassenfeld and his other lieutenants that uh, this is the right choice with their crown jewel and carving out an original agreement that would allow both sides to walk away if, God forbid, there was any backlash. Right. If there was anything negative attached to it. Right. And that takes time. I mean, it took me four years for Wizard of Oz mm. as a machine. It took me... Uh, we go back to NBA Jam. Yeah. Uh, it took me a year and a half just telling Sal and Mark, Sal DeVita and Mark Tremel, keep going. Uh, trust me, we'll be able to. I'm going to get this license for you. Don't stop. Don't stop. Just keep going, and I will make this happen. Mm. Just being devoted and dedicated to, uh, you know, to, to what the challenges are. What pushed him over the edge after seven years finally? To actually do it. <laughs> Probably just saying, all right, Roger, you're bored. Enough. <laughs> Leave me alone. Enough's enough. Just do it. But I, I have a certain work ethic. Yeah. And I think that work ethic is just, you know, predicated on how I was raised, the time frame. And it's something that I fervently believe in. That You, you don't do it for ego. Right. Uh, you do it because you believe in it. And, right. You know, I've always had, I guess, Maybe unfortunately or fortunately, I've always had a perverse sense of loyalty to the companies, agencies, magazines, whatever that I've worked with. Yeah. 
there. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Right. I'm doing it because it needs to be done, and I believe in it. And I believe in it with my heart and my soul. And uh, I'm going to make this happen. So it's a, it becomes a challenge. But I think that, you know, anything in life, um, if it's worth it, then you pay the price to make it worth it. And, uh, you know, I've worked on uh, a few hundred licensed projects over the years. Um you know, my first show was back in 87, so I've been at this for almost 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the relationships that I built, the reputation that I have, I, I take great humility and pride in because people know that when they are working with me on anything, right. they're going to get my heart, my soul, my energy, my passion, um, and I'm never going to let them down. I want to go on back to the side, whether it's licensee, licensor, yeah. or whatever else. I, I was gonna. I want to go back to the first one because people could. The Elvira one because people could say, "Well, Roger, you're Roger Sharp. You know, you have a track record. So you going to NBA Jam or Monopoly or Wizard of Oz? Those those weren't really track records back then. That was me just you know yeah. attempting to justify." Number one, Williams Bally Midway as a partner. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, gathering some credibility that you no know, pinball's on its way back. I mean, I used to get you know joked about by uh, you know the the president of the company because they'd see a feature in the New York Times front page quoting Roger Sharp that you know the business is doing five billion dollars a year. Where do you get these numbers from, Roger? What I don't know. I mean, they just, they printed it. If it's in New York Times, it must be true, Neil, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 was, I was this, you know, publicity person on behalf of the company. And since the notables of the company didn't want to be interviewed, I was like, you just talk to them, Roger. Mm -hmm. Really? Why? No, go. You just do it. So you take that lead and you run with it. And you build stories. Look, I, I, I was a director of marketing and effectively what became the director of licensing. That position didn't exist when I got there. But heading up marketing, I was doing trade shows. I was working with the ad agency. I was doing promotions. I was doing everything. And I was working as the intermediary, if you will, between corporate management, who may or may not have had a particular insight into what made a successful game, and the designers in the back who hopefully kind of respected my, my word my view so I could go back to corporate management to say hey thumbs up this game is looking good I only say that because so with, so yeah. with Monopoly and Elvira and whatever else it was just a question of uh, identifying something that made sense and going after it yeah. and trying to provide and again I go back to what we discussed earlier trying to be as referential as possible you know there's, there's articles and there's proof, I mean, whether it's my book or not, whether it's the fact that at one point in time I was the editor of Video Games Magazine, and you know I could reference that and have familiarity with that stuff, it was a question of really setting up and identifying what the opportunity was and who the partner could be with them that would pay tribute to them, that would do everything right with them, that would go through the appropriate steps and stages for approvals so that they had a hand in it every step of the way. So you make whatever the compelling sales pitch is and hope that you cover all bases. And more importantly, and I think it's true again with everything, you listen to the questions. Yeah. And answer the questions. You answer the concerns. And, you know, again, if you build up that reputation over a period of time and years and deals, people know the authenticity, at least by which I do my work. Yeah, I will ask about the first one, too, because some, I mean, probably a lot of people, licensing sounds great, you know, but they have no idea the, the mechanics behind actually setting up a licensing deal. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, everybody sees the, the end product and says, oh, God, it's so exciting. Did you get to meet with Arnold Schwarzenegger on Terminator? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. And, and you met with Cassandra? 
oh, 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, all of that is all, that's, that's icing on the cake. Then Gordie Howe, when we did hockey, I mean, the list kind of goes on and on right. and on. And, 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 and I don't uh, uh, lessen the, the value of that, but that's not why you do it. Right. Um, and, and there is an art to the deal, if you will. And everybody tends to think, look, all i got to do is throw money at whoever the, that targeted brand is, whether right. it's a personality, corporate identity, whatever else. Just throw enough money at them and we can do the deal. Well, no. No, yeah. no, no. It has to be much more personalized. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I give a lot of credit to uh, my stepfather who had clothing stores. One of them was in Evanston called Seelig's way back when. Uh-huh. And his personal style helped define my, I guess, my ultimate personal style. So, yeah, I mean, it's hands-on, it's touchy-feely. That's just me. I mean, so yeah. the Elvira first one, were there other options? Oh, yeah, you... absolutely. Uh, one of the ones I wanted to do, which went back to 87 before I worked with the company, was going to my first licensing show that was in New York City. And yes, there are conventions for this. Yeah. Um, and seeing three different properties that I thought were kind of interesting. Of uh, a couple of them, well, I guess all of them were upcoming movies or, or what have you. Probably a year, year and a half out. Uh, one was uh, Willow. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. And it was like, you know, I don't know. I'm seeing some of these clips. I think this is a little bit too hard edge. I don't think it's going to be the fantasy kind of end of all. The other was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Sure. And I figured that Disney would probably be difficult to work with. Plus, I just don't know. It looks a little bit too sexy. Um, and the third was from a couple of guys who had a black and white comic book that was now being represented for the first time, and there were great plans for it. It was called, the guys were Eastman and Laird, and it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And I said, God, this is crazy and weird and wonderful. Ha! Huh. And I remember making the pitch at uh, Williams to uh, have them consider Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Right. Which I said, this is going to hit. This is going to be big. Trust me. Believe me. Yeah, no. And then, and I forgot. You have a tough job with this. You have to predict somewhat the future. You have to yeah. pitch your company, and then you have to go pitch the other company to do a deal with your company. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and you want to make certain that at least internally, now with the clients that I'm working with and representing, or for the decades that I was at Williams Valley Midway WMS Gaming, that there really is a desire to want something and not just to fill in, no pun intended, for the slot machine, not to fill in a slot. Right. That, that the designers um, are really into Monopoly, are really into Iron Man, are into Willy Wonka. I mean, the list goes on and on. Terminator. Uh, Adam's Family, Twilight Zone, NBA Jam, NFL Blitz, uh, NHL Open Ice. I mean, again, on and on and on and on. That, uh, you know, what I am, in quotes, pursuing is something that everybody has uh, a specific interest uh, in wanting to bring to life. What happened with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Uh, they went elsewhere. Uh, D.D. East wound up doing a pinball, which was okay for them. Uh, Konami did a series of video games back in the day of the original Nintendo uh, system uh, that were very, very successful. And, yep, we didn't, we didn't go there. So, was so that all, I mean, a missed yeah. opportunity, but it was okay. It wasn't meant to be. What did the, for the Elvira one, since they, that was their first one, what did they want, what did your company want well, I mean, it, it was interesting. And it, again, I mean, I don't remember specifically how. Yeah. I might have, I think I might have encountered one of her managers back then at a trade at the licensing show. And then we kind of reached back mm. out. Cassandra was really into pinball. And really? Felt when, yeah. Oh. Was it neat to do a pinball machine? And Bally, obviously, let's face it, the song from Tommy, who doesn't want to be a pinball wizard. 
uh, the, the prehistory uh, back in the late 70s with Elton John, you know, Captain Fantastic, Wizard, uh, Dolly Parton, Holland Globetrotters, Rolling Stone, I mean, the list goes on and on from that era. Yeah. Uh, brand licensing for the company. Uh, and we got to talking, and it was just like, wow, really? Let me see what I can do. Right. I think this would be wonderful. Right. And we're going internally to the various design teams and just designers. Hi. I think I can get us Elvira. Who wants it? I think it should be a ballet game because it is Elvira. And Williams has never really kind of, in quotes, stood out mm-hmm. in the same fashion, if you will. Right. I use that as a uh, <clears throat> reference. Uh, Bally was known for having very beautiful, glamorous, over-endowed women. Right. Part of the artwork over the years. So I just said, it, this is Bally game. And uh, right. Dennis Nordman and Greg Ferris uh, stood up and said, yes, we'd love to do it if you can get it for us. And kind of, you know, went about the way of negotiating. And, you know, all, all the majority of licensing deals tend to embrace financials, whether they're guarantees royalties yeah how does that do they get a royal tend to get a royalty off of each one sold or how does that yeah okay yeah that's a simple answer uh if it's something where there's shared revenue then sometimes it's shared revenue that's part of that financial equation sometimes and in the case of cassandra uh there were also games involved along with financial remuneration because she was a fan of pinball wanted her own games so yeah Mm. So it was a combination. Yeah, and and it was it was great. I mean, uh, I will share just a, an aside during the process because we're on the phone, talking and kind of going through. And yes, I work closely in generating contracts and deal memos and so on. So it is multi-purpose in terms of the role that I've taken on. Right. Um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to jump back and forth, but there's a a linkage to it. Yeah. Uh, when I was offered the job of associate editor, um, my comment back to the managing editor and editor of GQ was, I know nothing about magazines. <laughs> you know how to type, you know how to write. Okay. And we wound up structuring things accordingly, but there was, there was no uh, handbook, if you will. When Condé Nast purchased GQ, and at that time I was the managing editor, and Condé Nast with Vogue and Mademoiselle and, and so on. Uh, they called in the, the chief editors as a fashion director, it was the editor-in-chief and myself, to, I guess, sit down, a meet and greet with an executive vice president of all of Condé Nast. And I remember sitting down across from uh, this gal. And I said, all right, so before we get started, let me tell you what I do as the managing editor, and you can tell me, if if it's what a managing editor does. Right. Because I don't know. Right. It's, and I start with this litany of stuff. And it's like, oh, my God, no, I have eight people at Vogue that do that. I have six people over here at, at Glamour that do that. I, huh? You're doing this? This? No, 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 no. You're, I mean, I, I was far out stripping what a typical manager, right. in quotes, should do. But it was like, again, there was no handbook. So with licensing, if you will, there was no handbook for it. I became, uh, I used to joke, uh, and still do, that I'm there from preconception to grave. Right. And that midpoint in between, however long or short it takes, think of me as a creative liaison to make things happen as effectively and efficiently as I possibly can. So if I can babysit throughout that process, that's what I do, so I keep my hands in it. And I can be protective of the people on this side, as well as looking out for the best interests of the people on the other side. Yeah. So in terms of Elvira, I forget, we were, I don't know if we were discussing a potential photo shoot, which we wound up doing. We sent a game out with a few of us to California, working with a photographer and so on, to do a photo shoot for effectively what was the pinball flyer that I was writing. Uh not even a discussion about the trade show appearance and how we were going to navigate that with her hair and makeup people and so on and so forth. But I'm on the phone with uh, one of her managers is actually someone who became her husband. Um, hmm. And I just remember this 
<clears throat> so we're having this conversation, and I hesitate for a minute. I said, oh, wait, one other thing. And I'm trying to remember what I want to ask. And just out of the blue, Mark Pearson was his name. Mark said, yep, they're real. And I said, huh? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It was not what I was going to ask, but thank you. That's hilarious. So, again, you, you, you get relationships, and you have uh, discussions along the way to get back to you know the point that you had brought up about, you know, mm-hmm. How how does this process work, and what are you doing? And uh, yeah, so it is for me at least. I am I am rare, I guess. Um, I am anomaly. Uh, there are no other people that kind of do what I have done the way that I do it. And I don't say that with any measure of pride necessarily, so much as it is. I don't know, it's just. The only way I know how to do it. Yeah. What's is the, was the Monopoly the hardest one you put together? Or what would you say the hardest licensing deal was? Well, I mean, that was a daunting task. Yeah. Absolutely. Because the, there was nothing to work off of. And just trying to get them to embrace this notion of where, you know, where Leisure Time Entertainment was going and where there was a unique opportunity. Uh, to, to take advantage of some extended exposure in a way that maybe the brand hadn't enjoyed and wasn't enjoying. You know, something to further perpetuate the beauty and wonder and marvel and timelessness of Monopoly. Um, yeah. That was a hard one, but, you know. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Bless you. Uh, just, I guess sneezing on the truth is my mother. <laughs> and, um the Terminator. A little, a little religious sidebar there, but yeah. anyway, um, huh. I think uh, all of them have their own unique challenges. Yeah. Uh, I've always believed that uh, the easiest deals are the deals that are yes. The ones that I really enjoy are the ones that say no, uh, to begin with. Mm. Because it allows me a chance to turn that no into a yes. And I have two guiding principles. Uh, one is if the expectation of financials is not practical or realistic, then um, then I can't fight that. Right. If you want X amount of dollars and it really is X minus Y, that's the only practical yeah. way to do it. And X minus Y needs to be it. If you don't like the particular category, and I've done work in, in, in other fields other than just, you know, slot machines and coin operating music games. But if if you have some if you have some resistance to wanting to be part of it, well then my attitude is that that resistance needs to be based on fact. Mm-hmm. Can't be based on stigma or, you know, the wrong thinking. It has to be based on the principles of it being something that you are just diametrically opposed. So there may be somebody who doesn't want to who doesn't want to be part of gaming. We'll use that as an example. Well, for what reason? Well, because I think it, it only appeals to old people and you're taking their money. Oh, au contraire. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's talk about let's talk about reality. Um, and the reality is X, Y, and Z. If you still then feel that you don't want to be involved with it, then I understand. You know, if you absolutely are against or opposed to you know pinball, okay. Then that's the right reason. I can't. I can't change an ideology. All I can do is correct that ideology so that the reasons that you're saying it, that you don't want to go forward, are real. And there have been times that people have said absolutely no, under no circumstance, no, 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 and suddenly they come back and it's like, okay, is that opportunity still available? <laughs> Check. Let me see. Because sometimes it's a confluence of timing. Yeah. You know, timing really needs to be there in any business dynamic. You know, sometimes you're too early, sometimes you're too late, sometimes you get it just right. 
Yeah, so you'll take a no if the just the money to spare. They want way too much money, and it's just not possible. Oh, I've turned down things, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've even gone back into, and again, this is my perverse sense of loyalty. I've gone back into upper management saying, I would advise us not spending any more on this. Right. I wouldn't do it because I always tended to think of it as being my money, even though it wasn't. Right. Well, let's offer them X. No, it's not worth it. Right. Offer them that. All right, fine. <laughs> Let me offer it. All right, we got a deal done. Whoopee. Great. Are we going to be in impairment? Can we earn it out? Yeah. Is it really yeah. worth it? So, again, that's my level of uh, sensitivity. How was the Terminator one? Oh, that was great. Um, I flew out. We had a meeting set up uh, with Jim Cameron and Larry Kasanoff, director and producer. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so we were flying out to read the script and to meet with them to see if we even wanted to do it. The original conversation I had had with a fellow by the name of Danny Simon, who at that time was uh, working with uh, Carol Co., who was putting together Terminator, and Danny and I had had our paths crossed some years earlier, which we didn't realize until we started talking. Um, we had talked about Total Recall. Yeah. It was a possible theme for a pinball machine. And the timing wasn't right. And he said, well, you know, Terminator is coming back. It's like, wow, really? I still remember. And, and when he talked about how long it had been, he was like, no, no, that can't be that long. I still remember the hand. It's a mechanical hand. Right, exactly. Like, it's been that long? Wow. Okay, this is like 91. So we set it up when we were flying out. Uh, Steve Ritchie was going to be the designer on the pinball. And uh, George Petro was going to be one of the lead designers on the, uh, the video game, if we were going to do them. And my comment to them, and I knew that a claim was going to be going out there as well because they were looking at locking in the home rights uh, for cartridges. Yeah. And uh, just told the guys, I'm kind of notorious uh, in terms of my, my dress and my style. We're sneakers a lot. Um, uh, not sneakers with a suit, but, you know, sport coats, slacks, tie, sneakers. sneakers, white sneakers. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's my look. Okay. Uh, but I told them, I said, uh, I want us going out, I want us wearing suits. And uh, I said, I'm going to bring real shoes. I, I, I do actually have real shoes. I'm bringing a suit, I want you to have suits. I had to go with Steve Ritchie. Steve didn't own a suit to get him to buy a suit for the trip because I wanted to go in being really serious. Right. And uh, I remember names will remain nameless in, in terms of the acclaimed people who were a little bit more cash, if you will, for the meeting. And we were sitting in uh, the offices and uh, we had uh, read the script and kind of knew what was going on. And at that time... In video games, uh, there was a breakthrough that Eugene Jarvis had kind of headed up, which was motion capture for a game called NARC. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, that. I'm not. I didn't see that. Uh, but uh, it was like the, the starting point for the Mortal Kombat of the world and other games mm. that used real talent. And it was a man-run unit and, and all sorts of other things. And George had been on that team. And I wanted him to bring some footage to show the making of video games, because we're not just doing little spritey things or whatever else. Uh, we're actually making, you know, video. Uh, the, the, the days of Pac-Man were, if not over, at least ending uh, in regard to what you could uh, actually create for, uh, for on screen. So uh, Cameron walks in, looks at us, we introduce ourselves, he said, and I just remember the first couple <laughs> well, we got bankers in here? And it was exactly the response or reaction I wanted. It is. It was like, absolutely. Yeah. We are we're serious about everything. And, and Steve talked about the design for pinball and what goes on. And we had the, uh, the presentation that George had brought. And I remember Jim turning his head and saying, you guys are doing movies just like we are. And it's like, yeah, exactly wow. right. That's amazing. And the guys are just quiet. 
Yeah. We're not doing movies. <laughs> we're going to do a horizontal scrolling game of <laughs> some sort. <clears throat> and uh, you blew them away with your presentation, and in the oh yeah. With that being speech. said, uh, it was like, well, you guys got to get over to see Stan. You know, we'll, we'll set that up for you guys to go over this afternoon to go to uh, to Stan Winston uh, because you're going to need access to stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, I, I need access to Arnold. I need access to everybody. Can we get that? And uh, we were able to achieve the kind of commitment that we needed, I think, because we came in really serious just in our look, our approach. You know, we're serious about making great games. Well, that's and amazing. So it worked out really well. Um, and uh, the games were incredibly successful, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And working with Arnold was uh, was kind of cool, and we had games for the premiere. It's very strange, and I've done it a few times, uh, walking down the red carpet, and people are taking pictures, and it's like, I'm nobody. You know, don't take my picture. I'm not even a second or a third in any scene anywhere in that movie. <laughs> um, and, you know. You go into the theater, and, and then after the after party, and there you are standing with different celebrities by pinball machines for video games and trying to give them a little how-to. And, so do they uh, end up playing them on the premieres oh, or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, wow. Yep. So, it, again, it's, uh, I guess it's one of the byproducts, one of the perks, if you will. And I know that, uh, you know, Steve Rosen has experienced that as well at, at uh, various trade shows for slot machines, you know, where we have people there for ribbon cutting or what have you, and there they are, you know, buy the games for publicity reasons or just to play them. And so it's. Uh, How did you meet Steve? Um, we met when he actually came on board at uh, WMS. I know that he was at Midway before. Uh, I don't think that our paths had crossed necessarily, although they might have. And uh, he was this. Uh, young, very intelligent uh, person, and I'm just this old fart, but uh, yeah, we kind of hit it off and played golf a few times together, yeah. and uh, was there to uh, hopefully give some guidance and advice yeah. on a number of different projects that uh, were license-based that he was overseeing as a producer. Yeah, because he obviously considers you a mentor of his. Well, and I'm appreciative yeah. of that. Um uh, I'd like to think that whatever words of wisdom and guidance that I have given have been uh, beneficial. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think highly of Steve. Uh, I think he really is wonderful. He's great, yeah. And I think that, you know, depending on what he wants to do with his career ultimately, um, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Roger, this has been fantastic. I have... Uh Two more questions for you. I know we're. I'm like looking up. I'm getting wrapped up in your stories here. So, um, my apologies again. I told you paragraphs, and I'm just no. looking at the time and realizing I've kept you on. Far That's too okay. Long. Uh, do you have a few uh, time for a few more questions, or uh, you... I, yeah, I kind of as I said, I blocked out time. Okay. I haven't heard the phone ringing off the hook. Thank God uh, for a Monday. God only knows how much email is piled up. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. But it's okay. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the lowest point and the proudest moment. What's been, would you say, the lowest point and then how you got through those tough times? Hmm. Um, I guess I'll do things that are close to home. Lowest point was losing my father when I was 14. Hmm. And uh, needing to, you know, find a way on your own. Uh, highest point, the birth of my sons. Yeah. That's my legacy. My boys, I'm so proud of them. Forget about pinball, just proud of them and the values that they have and the men that they've become. So, I guess it's all, you know, family-based, if yeah. you will. That's uh, the low, lowest you can get. Yeah, I mean, just the unexpected. My, my dad was very sick. Um, I saw him a few weeks before he passed away. Uh, he was in a hospital in New York. Mm. And uh, you don't know. I mean, uh, there was no warning or anything else. So uh, I think it tends to uh, shape people when they have those kind of life experiences. And it either drops you down or it lifts yeah. you up. Um, right. I think that, uh, you know, 
for me at least, in the way that I've lived my life, I guess it has always been something, and maybe it goes to the heart of you know how I have been professionally. The no's I have to change to yeses. Right. The conceived notion as to who I am and what I'm about. You may not like me, hmm. but you are only allowed not to like me for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I know that's you know nonsensical, but you know it, it's. My mother used to joke, yeah, if I say black, you say white. And I said, well, there's gray in the middle, Mom, um, as long as the gray in the middle is right. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that it made me... Um, you think stronger. it toughened you up at the time? Oh, it's yeah, really I tough. Think it has to. I think yeah. when you lose a parent yeah. uh, that early in life, uh, that it absolutely shapes, shapes you yeah. in a way that maybe you wouldn't have been shaped before and I look I, I count my blessings that uh, the, the man that my mother found to, to marry uh, after my dad passed away was incredible it was yeah. wonderful I mean I, I, I used to dream about the fact I wouldn't have been great to have both of them simultaneously yeah, um, yeah I mean I, I again I was blessed and, and again going back to you know what's the proudest moment um it's the uncertainty if you really have a desire to want to be a parent, and maybe some of that was driven by my my growing up um, and the way I grew up uh, in, in terms of losing my father, of uh, wanting to have a family, wanting to continue, you know, the lineage. Yeah. And uh, not knowing, I didn't know if I could. Didn't know if my wife could. Right. And being blessed with having uh, the birth of my sons. Oh, yeah. And being there? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, work-wise, obviously, there's other things that come into play. What's been the proudest work, business-wise, for you? God. I don't know. There's been so many. Um, I think surviving and enduring early on. Well, talk about what's late. Yeah, what what are you working on lately? Well, well, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, because I tend to think of it as being more self-serving. But I think that, you know, there was a point in time, uh, again, this, this somewhat, not a rude, but this somewhat naive person out of the Midwest working at NWR. Uh, the account that I was working on was AT&T um, and, and a couple of other accounts as part of the promotions and exhibits group. And uh, working on a project that I thought was just absolutely incredible and sitting in a pitch meeting and, they didn't like it, and a fellow by the name of Dave Iden, because I went back to my office crushed. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know, 21. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Great, they don't see it, they don't recognize it, and Dave kind of took me aside, and it was something that was a difficult lesson to learn. And again, depending on the career path that somebody has, um, he said, look, you know, they don't know anything. Don't worry about it. It's not you. It's just they didn't like that idea. Right. And you have to be able to separate going yeah. forward. Whatever the idea is, whatever the output is, whatever you're thinking of creatively, that they're not attacking you personally. Right. And I was like, wow. Okay, I can do that. Mm-hmm. People uh, tend to take so, things personally. You know, what, right. So what yeah. am I doing now? Uh well, Sharp Communications is a uh, creative services agency, and you know what we specialize in is everything from brand licensing to uh, advertising and marketing and promotion and PR and product design and development. All the things that I have touched, all the things that I have worked on over my entire professional career touches all of those particular disciplines. So I have a range of clients and a number of different projects, and uh, I get to babysit them all, and as you suggested, go through that arduous process <laughs> of however long it takes. Can I track down the rights holder? God, they want such and such? Okay, how do I get to that guy? Right, and, how do you get, get to these um, people? Right. Or Flappy Bird as a license. How do I track this thing down? 
versus the ones that are easy. What's the oh. one that you thought was the toughest that you actually, like just tracking the person or whatever? Oh, one of the toughest, down. obviously, yeah. and, and admittedly, would have been uh, Willy Wonka. Uh-huh. It was trying to get the rights. It, it took me uh, about four years, maybe close to five, to yeah. pull yeah. one together. Uh, you know, tracking down, uh, let's see, the studio that produced the movie, they have, nope, all right, David Walper and Associates, all right, let me try to reach that. Wow. Talking to some assistant to say hi. Oh, no, 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 it has to go back to uh, Lizzie Dahl, Raul Dahl's widow. Okay, where is oh she? Oh, my God. The UK, all right, let me reach out to them. Let me do this, let me do that. I mean... This is what I want to hear. Yeah, I want to hear the nitty-gritty stuff. So it was, uh, you know, yeah. all of that... Uh, initial whole work, if you will, yeah. uh, just digging up the ground and trying to get some firm stances to, all right, where can I start planting my seeds? Where can I start to grow this so that maybe we can get it done? Yeah. And eventually Warner Brothers came on board with the project and uh, got to turn a, yet, a no into a yes. Um, and the net result, and I know that it is still a core brand for what is now known as scientific games. It's a core brand for them. I take a lot of pride in the fact that they never would have had it if I hadn't been there. And they never would have had it if I hadn't been willing to stay the course, to be persistent, to not yeah. give up, and to just, you know, hey, it's a new day. Look, there's far too many voicemails and emails of, like, I'm sorry to bother you again. Don't mean to be annoying. Don't mean to be persistent. But is there a decision yet? Where are we going? What's going on? And sometimes right. people are difficult to track down. Right. Uh, during the course of a year, there are any number of you know trade shows and business events, and God only knows what, where the people who have said we'll talk next week suddenly next week becomes next month. Right. Or and, next year at the trade show. Or exactly. Or next year. I mean, I've been working on some projects for a current client that I began uh, back in June where I'm now reaching closure on the first couple. Right. Oh, that's what, eight months? Nine months? Right. That's insanity. But it isn't. It's something that I thrive on. And my only hope is that the clients that I work with have an understanding of uh, you know, the task at hand. I have also had situations, and this will remain nameless. Yeah four projects where everything up front is great and the final approvals are the pain. Mm. Gone, All the red tape and stuff. Oh, I've gone through two and three years of back wow. and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Jeez. Of, uh, oh, my God. And even to the point where I've had situations where it's like, God, we really have an interest in wanting to pursue this. And it's like, nope, nope, don't want to. Don't want to do it. Going to be too difficult. Don't know what you're getting into. I prefer us not to do that. I've already worked with them on a couple of things. I'm just telling you ahead of right, time. Right. I'll save you seven years. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Truly. But again, I mean, that's it, it is the art of the deal. It is relationships. Yeah. Um, because that's really what it boils down to. Ultimately, it's a, it's, it's building that trust. Do they trust what you are saying? If I'm going into a category for the first time as a licensor or a licensee, okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's look at it because I've been on the other side of the fence as a licensor. Mortal Kombat, we had an incredible program. You know, feature movies and action figures and hats and t-shirts, you, you name it. Uh, but you don't want to feel like you are being uh, taken advantage of. Right. Roger, how do I know that this is the best deal? And that you're not trying to take advantage of me. You know, that's been asked a number of times. Right. What are you talking? We've never done anything in this category before. How do I know that this is good? Or I've had other things where I'm not involved at all, but I have people from studios or sports leagues or whatever else agents reaching out to me for advice. Yeah, Roger, can't tell you who the partner is, but this is kind of what they're offering. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think you can do better. Yeah. And this is what I would advise. People just don't know what's good for right. certain things, right? And, and again, not being anyone who was complicit in any way, shape, or form. I was like, hey, they asked for some advice. It doesn't impact what it is that I'm working on or any of my clients uh, and, and whether I have 
anything that is strictly and uh, significantly set in stone where it's a non-compete in a category, uh, yeah, let me give some advice. I know when we turned down, we being the company known then as WMS Gaming, it was like uh, we did two pinball machines with Cassandra. Both were incredibly successful. She is game and open to do a slot machine. Yeah. Cool. Let's see what we can do. This is going to be great. And we turned it down as a company. They want to do it. Really? Well, they were approached uh, by some others and asked my advice. You know, what do you think of these companies? And I was like, oh, these are pretty good. Okay. And then, you know, a few weeks later, a couple of months later, you wind up hearing from Mark and Cassandra. They made this offer. What do you think? No way in hell. This is what it should be. Mm. So you get close to the... Well, what happens if they say no? Look... All you're going to do is you're not demanding. You're asking. This is part of the negotiation. If they say no because you're just asking a question as to, you know, would it be possible to get more or different or better, well, then how is it going to be when they're going to do creative? I mean, model was on that up front. I don't think that asking for anything different is terrible. I mean, if I'm going to buy a house... Uh, if I make a low ball offer, it doesn't necessarily mean when they say no that I'm out of it. Right. Maybe they'll come back and say, hi, I'll take $5,000 off. Right. Ooh, God. now we're having some fun. <laughs> this is going into a department store where the merchandise is labeled and that dress is going to cost $490 or you go to the salesperson saying, you know what, <sighs> my wife here really loves that dress. I'll give you 300 for it. I mean, this is not... You know, a foreign country where you wind the up... The worst thing is they say no. Haggling. Right. So, so yes. I mean, I think that that becomes uh, a, a real dividing line uh, when it comes to trying to secure relationships. Has there been any kind of prior experience in the category or with this particular company on either side of the fence? And if there isn't, then you know that, you know, all right, let's put on... You know, the high waiters, and, and we're going to get through this. Yeah. So, what kind of companies come to you now? Is it slot machine companies, or what? I am working on behalf of a uh, slot machine company. I have worked in the, the online space with some uh, providers. Uh, many of my clients are coin operated amusement game clients, only because I've been around that for so long. Right. So, whether it's video game companies, uh, pinball companies, developers. Uh, people wanting representation. Um, you know, I'm still looking at doing some designing myself, and we'll see if that comes really? around. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, I've had other companies outside the category and field who have come to my company for for marketing, uh, for PR, uh, for advertising. Um, so it's been uh, it's pre- pretty diverse in many ways. Uh, which is great. Uh, I have, uh, again, I am blessed and fortunate. I have an incredible network. And it's like, hi, so-and-so suggested I contact you that maybe you can help us. Here's what we are launching for this exhibition, and we're looking for financial backers, benefactors. Are you interested? Yeah. Um, Sure. Let me see what I can do. Or there have been times where, you know what, no, that's nothing that I can do, but why don't you contact these people, use my name, and let's see if they can help you. Yeah. And then I have also, you know, business associates, uh, both here as well as abroad, that I work with uh, on, you know, particular endeavors. So that is sharp communications. Yeah. You have a lot on your plate. <laughs> I do, but, you know, I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, is there an overlap with some clients who are in the same category but working on different projects? Absolutely. But, again, I've built up enough trust where everybody knows that I'm not going to reveal anything from one client. Right. To you keep it confidential between clients. and you know, uh, I do, and yeah. more importantly, everybody also knows, depending on category, if somebody is desirous of a particular license, ask me first. Because I've had situations where it's like, Roger, we're just thinking that we'd love to get Y. Yeah. 
you can come. Well, I got to tell you something. Yeah. You know, right now, terrain. I already have somebody wanting wine. Mm. Um, if they fall out, if things don't happen, I will absolutely come back to you. You're second in line. Yeah. You're third in line. You're fourth in line. And I don't want to feel like I'm a deli counter, but there have been occasions where that has been the case. That's a good position to be in, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. You know, I've had a situation truly where somebody, uh, again, uh, one of my clients, who questioned because there was a brand that came out from a competitor. I was like, I got this phone call. I was like, hey, what the heck's happening? I thought that we were going to get it if so-and-so wasn't going to get it. And I was like, well, if you look closely at it, the people who developed it that I did the license for are the ones that actually have a license. They went to a different manufacturer. That's why I wanted getting an apology. All right, you're right. You're right. I said, no, I never betray you. <laughs> so, again, you know, sometimes there's a delicate balance yeah. of it, but uh, I'd like to think that over the years I've come up with, uh, you know, the, the correct approach yeah. to, uh, to thrive and survive yeah. on behalf of my clients. I mean, that's valuable just to kind of know the terrain. If someone wants a certain thing, you can kind of gauge from the relationships you had this is a great company to work with or great this this will take x amount of time or you know if you've seen certain things over your with your experience that could come in very handy for a company i would say i, I think so and, and truly all i ask of a client that is desirous of a particular property is uh, i want a business plan uh, give me what the financial parameters are what you yeah. kind of, what kind of rights do you need yeah because well, your I, reputation also Right. And I want to know that, you know, what they are doing is something I believe in. There have been some times where somebody has wanted something that's like, you know, I'm just not comfortable with, with, with doing this. Yeah. Or going back to the potential licensor and just saying, hi, um, I'm not going to do it because I, I just don't think the quality is going to be there. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the support is going to be there. So... Uh, if you wind up getting pitched by you know somebody else or whatever else, just be forewarned. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, I I want to be, and, and again, I, I don't think that it's it's vanity or anything else. Uh, I I, I want to believe in in everything that I am going to be touching. Yeah. Roger, this has been absolutely fantastic. Where should we lead, what should we um, where should we point people towards? What uh, where can they find you? What website? Uh, I don't have a website for my company. Um, you know, Sharpcom One is uh, me and AOL. Yes, probably the only person still using AOL in the world, uh, as my sons point out. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm around. I'm available potentially. I guess they could find you on LinkedIn if they want to say hello, connect I'm with sorry? you. Uh, LinkedIn, they could find you. and Yes, they can find me on LinkedIn. You. Thank you. Yes. Um, what uh, lesson should we leave people with? I mean, we talked about a lot of different things. I think these, these look the lessons. Yeah. There are life lessons in, in, in regard to, uh, you know, what you have done so well with uh, some of your other interviews. And I'm just this kind of blip off on the side with some very strange... Um, category, a product that has somewhat defined my life. Right. I, I think the only suggestion and advice that I would offer would just be true to to oneself. Yeah. You have to find some satisfaction in your life, and I know that some people are totally focused in on on the money, and I don't negate that. I think that that's great, but at the end of the day when you kind of look back, have you accomplished and achieved what you always wanted to do within reality? Look, you know, I'm beyond the point of running in the Olympics or being a professional baseball player or being a professional bowler. You know, those were great things. And if, if the skill and talent level had been there at some point in time, I would have pursued it. But I think that sometimes we find ourselves hopefully doing things that give us satisfaction. At the end of the day, there's a level of enthusiasm and excitement. There's a sense of um, satisfaction that you've actually done something that day that was meaningful, even if it was a small step to multiple steps. Um, 
just take pride in the excellence of what you can achieve as a human being. I, I think that that really is, you know, my guiding principle. Yeah. I was talking about... Well, I know it's old-fashioned. Yeah. I know it probably doesn't work anymore uh, for people, but um, I, I think that, you know, you have to have a certain level of morality. Uh, you have to have a certain value set that defines who you are. I don't care if that means that you're not the best plumber in the world or the best electrician, but you're going to do the best that you can do on every job that is given to you. And, uh, you know, if there's something that's more meaningful in terms of being a doctor or an attorney, uh, that you're going to take care of your patients and clients to the best of your ability and see it through so that uh, they deserve the kind of care uh, that they deserve. Yeah. I, yeah. I, think, I think it transcends, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. If that's meaningful at all about being too philosophical or sure. thinking as if I'm somehow pontificating, which mm-hmm. I'm not. No, doing. not at all. No, I appreciate that. Steve, I was asking Steve, I'm like, what should I be asking Roger? What's some interesting things? And he says whenever you have a meeting, you'll lay candy on the table. <laughs> yes, well, I do. What's, about, what's that about? All right. So, um, <laughs> I years ago, and, and less so now, fortunately, I, I used to go to many different trade shows. Yeah. In a variety of categories, and that goes back to my days at GQ, um, where I was covering a lot of different fields just out of curiosity. Right. Many of the subjects I was writing on, some of them I was assigning. But, you know, I was there at a point in time where, and, and this is not necessarily not wanting to be politically correct, but GQ, when I got there, was a gay trade magazine, basically. Right. And I was there at a point in time to really kind of change its course and turn it into a men's lifestyle magazine. So in doing that, kind of really looking at the front and back of the book, as well as the well, the middle, and coming up with features, subjects, and so on, from you know, uh, investing to grooming to travel to the type, types of audio systems you may want. And I know that that term is no longer used, so my apologies, or... <laughs> the type of car you want to drive. I mean, all of that right. became part and parcel. So I wanted to go into a lot of trade shows, and that kind of continued as my career kind of continued as well. And there was one occasion at one point in time where I was at a trade show, and you're walking floors for however many days, hours. It gets dry. I mean, if I'm at a consumer electronics show, as I used to do years and years ago, all of <laughs> all the moisture in the air is just sapped by all of the product that's on the floor, from TVs to, to so on. Right. Computers and all the rest of it. So I'd always have some candy in my shoulder bag. Um, because during the course of the day, you know, just a couple of little pieces of gummy bears or whatever else. I was in a meeting at, uh, again, one trade show, however many years ago. I'm at the end of a table, and, you know, the discussion is going on, and person at the other end of the table is talking or whatever, and I very delicately, lightly reached down to the floor to my bag and and went through to find some candy, and I got some candy. I thought that I had not made too much noise with the crinkling of plastic or whatever else, and I am going to put some candy (laughs) into my mouth (laughs) expectedly from anybody else, not being anything, and I guess the person was talking. Just as I'm about to engulf about three or four gummy bears, I said, oh, did you bring enough for everybody else? And, you know, six or eight heads all turn to me as I am engulfing my gummy bears. And I said, oh, huh? okay, sure. And I broke out, you know, some of the candy that I had, passed it around. Everybody loved what I had. It wasn't packaged. It wasn't like, you know, packaged stuff that you would find at drugstore or whatever else, this was gourmet stuff. Right. And we can get into a whole discussion about that, but it word kind of traveled. Again, small worlds that you wind up traveling in, depending on what your field of endeavor is, and suddenly it was Roger as a candy guy. Mm. So, yes, I do candy runs. I actually just did one. I'm going to be in New York next week for Toy Fair. And I did my candy run to uh, Woodfield Mall. I'll do a plug for Get Happy. It's just across from Rainforest Cafe, marvelous candy. 
uh, and bins. Love it. And, uh, yeah, I did my camera. How much do you have to actually buy for your meetings for this toy, uh, toy uh, collection? Well, probably going to ask Steve on that, but uh, I spent uh, this last go-around uh, upwards of over $40 worth of candy. Okay. Nice. So I have multiple bags of things, different flavors, some sours, some sweets, some new things. I always try to bring something that's new. Yeah. I'll do a little bit of world market because some of it is already packaged and wrapped. I know that there are some people that uh, right. from years ago with SARS and everything else do not really appreciate my reaching into my bag, even though I may do it for myself and engulf. Right. Uh, would prefer not to have anybody touching anything. It's like, that's fine. Right. Up candy as well as Preloaded candy. So. Well, I had to ask that because he said that. I'm like, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yep, so that's that's how it all happened. Again, a selfish little thing done quietly, I thought, <clears throat> and having an entire table turn and saying, okay, what do you got? Yep. And then meeting, I do remember this, needing to go out somewhere because I had run out of candy. Well. And needing to find a place, and I did. Uh, find a place that had the kinds of candies that I wanted personally because everything is personal for me when it comes to my, my candy selection. So, yeah. It's got the mustache, the glasses, sneakers, and candy. That's me. Love it. You know, from thank you so much, Roger, from going from just wanting your own pinball game to what you've done is pretty <laughs> remarkable. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, it's my so. pleasure. I wish that the uh, the Skype stuff had worked longer no, for I, you. Uh, I'm uh, I'm appreciative of you having the interest and desire to actually want to talk. And hopefully, one of these days, although it won't be on a basketball court, we'll have a chance to actually get together in person. Maybe well. over a game of pinball. There you go. You're on. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other. Just you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand